Good morning to Chinese colleagues, Australia colleagues, and a good evening to the colleagues from uh, America. On behalf of the organizer of the BCGC symposium, I warmly welcome all of you to attend the BCGC uh, symposium. Uh, this symposium is a part of the two, 20, 2022 Teng Chung Scientist Forum. Uh, this is a forum is a very high level uh, uh, meetings uh, organized by the China Association for Science and Technology and the Yunnan Provincial Government. And uh, this, this symposium is co-organized by uh, International Society of Zoological Sciences uh, and the International uh, Cooperation Department of uh, uh, China Association for Science and Technology and the Institute of Zoology of Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, as you know, we, we already have some information about the BCGC program. Uh, this program was uh, uh, launched by the uh, Institute, uh, International Society of the Zoological Sciences and uh, supported by uh, 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 China Association for Science and Technology, Chinese Academy of Sciences, and the uh, International Union of Biological Sciences. Uh, the goal of the uh, BCGC uh, International Program uh, is to uh, assess the impact of the global change on the biodiversity losses and uh, prevalence of zoological diseases and biological invasion and outbreak of uh, pests and uh, uh, resources uh, depletations. Uh, as all you know, uh, the uh, COP27 uh, COP for uh, UN uh, climate change uh, just uh, uh, finished and uh, uh, Climate change, uh, global change is a big issue now uh, to the world for conservation and um, for the disease control issues. So I think that the, this uh, symposium is very important. Uh, we are very pleased to uh, invite uh, uh, seven uh, speakers uh, from China, Australia, and, uh, and uh, from America. Uh, because the time uh, differences, we are not able to invite the uh, scientists from uh, Europe. And uh, we are very honored to uh, have uh, uh, president, uh, Vice President of Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, uh, Zhang Yaping, and the uh, Director uh, of the International Cooperation Department of uh, China Association for Science and Technology, Luo Hui, uh, give attend the opening and give us our uh, opening remarks. So first of all, uh, I would uh, like to introduce uh, uh, our invited uh, guest. Uh, as I, I just uh, introduced, uh, uh, Yaping Zhang, uh, uh, he is a vice president and uh, member of Chinese Academy of Sciences. And uh, also uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences provide very important support to our BCGC program. Uh, the second uh, uh, invited guest is uh, 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 Ms. Uh, uh, Luo Hui. Uh, he's a head for the uh, International uh, Cooperation Department uh, from the China Association for Science and Technology. And uh, Professor Wei Fu Wen, uh, he's a professor from the Institute of Zoology of Chinese Academy of Sciences and also a member of Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, professor Charles Krebs, uh, he's a professor from the University of British Columbia, Canada. And uh, he's also a member of the Royal Canadian Academy of Sciences. Um, professor Christoph uh, Dickman, he's a professor from the University of uh, uh, Sydney, uh, uh, Australia. Uh, he's also a member of the Australian Academy of Sciences. And uh, um, Mrs. Uh, Chao Gexia, uh, she's a, a professor and a director of the Institute of Zoology of Chinese Academy of Sciences. And uh, 
Mr. Yao Yonggang. He, he is a professor and a director of the Institute of Kunming Institute of Zoology of uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, professor Zhi Heng Wang, uh, he's a professor from the Peking University. Professor Du Wei Guo, he's a professor from the Institute of Zoology of Chinese Academy of Sciences. And I'm also from the uh, Institute of Zoology of Chinese uh, Academy of Sciences. Um, this uh, um, BCGC programs uh, are planned to be held in the Tengtung city. And because of pandemic problem, so we have to uh, held the uh, held the meeting uh, online, uh, and uh, uh, Miss Feng Kai from the uh, international uh, uh, depart uh, international cooperation department of the uh, China Association for Science and Technology, and uh, Miss uh, Mr. Liu Ming from the Institute of Zoology, also from the uh, Inst uh, International Society of Zoological Sciences, provided. Uh, uh, valuable help uh, in organizing this symposium. So we are very grateful to all the uh, invited guests and uh, uh, all the participants from, uh, uh, mostly I think from China, uh, but I also say from the world. So thank you very much for attending this very uh, important uh, uh, symposium. So uh, now we uh, move on to the, our schedule for the symposium. Uh, first, uh, we'll welcome, uh, uh, Vice President, uh, Zhang Yaping, uh, from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, give, uh, opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr., Ms., uh, Luo Hui, uh, uh, Mr. Luo Hui and the China Association Science Technology, uh, provide a lot of help and guidance, uh, to the international society uh, and the BCGC program. So, uh, we will carry on uh, our BCGC program uh, as uh, uh, pointed by uh, Vice President Ya Ping Zhang and uh, Luo Hui. Uh, we will uh, organize uh, uh, more uh, meetings and uh, corporations and to launch a uh, project in, in, in the world to uh, promote the understanding of the impact of the global change on uh, the animal world. So, uh, next, uh, we'll uh, welcome uh, Professor Charlie Krebs. Uh, sorry, uh, welcome uh, Professor Wei Fu Wen uh, to give a, a lecture. Uh, his uh, uh, topic is about paleoclimate change and uh, human activities shape animal population histories uh, using uh, genom uh, genomic approaches. And Professor Wei Fu Wen is a very famous uh, uh, zoologist. Uh, in conservation biology and uh, also an uh, expert uh, on the panda uh, uh, conservation. So now welcome uh, Professor Wei Fu Wen give uh, our uh, give uh, uh, presentations. Okay. Uh, thanks for just being um, to invite me to give a talk at this important symposium. Mm. Can you help me, Jimmy? Yes, yes, very clear. Thank you. Carry on. Okay. I, I don't know how to get this screen bigger. Uh, it's uh, very nice to meet Crips, uh, old friends, Crips, uh, and myself and everybody uh, in China. Uh, uh, after getting the invitation from Zibing, I try to refuse, decline, because I think I do not do much more works about the climate change. Uh, at the pursuit of the Zibing, uh, so I think what I should talk uh, at this uh, important symposium about climate change, uh, uh, we uh, gave a talk, uh, a title, like the, uh, how to use the genomics uh, to construct the populist history uh, of the endangered species. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, next 
generation sequence has great advanced development of not only the conservation biology, all the biology. Uh, a lot of omics has been appeared, such as uh, genomics, transcriptomics, uh, epigenomics, metagenomics, or protom protomomics, metabonomics. Uh, there are at least the 70 uh, different kinds of the omics, as uh, Professor Yang Huan Ming told me. Uh, uh, what what matter uh, uh so it still matter how how many is over there so what can be uh, used uh, uh, for our understanding of the uh, species uh traits or species conservation species uh uh correspondent to the climate change etc uh so we have different kinds of uh, dis uh, is like the population genomics, uh, comparative uh, genomics uh, for the application we can, it can be used for the conservation, like the conservation genomics or conservation metagenomics as well. I proposed for a new one. So how can genomics help to construct the population history of endangered species? Um, Today, I would like to give you three uh, examples of uh, what we have done in the past 10 years to uh, show that. Uh, the first story uh, is about the population history of John Pender. Uh, even though it's old story, it's about 10 years, 10 years ago's work, but I think it's still very important. Uh, because this that will be the first one would be the first one for population genomics uh, to understand the the, the population fluctuation uh, in the history. Uh, so how how can we do that? Uh, uh, so it's very important to get the genome of the uh, species. So I, I part I participated in the Huada. Uh, BGI as uh, panda sequence uh, 10 years ago, uh, uh, 12 years ago. Uh, so during this project, the most important is we developed a new software we call the SOAP Delova. Uh, this is the first one to how to denove the short uh, sequence to into a scaffold or uh, 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 or a genome. So it has been applied uh, to many species after this paper has been published. I use a new um, software methodology, or we call that PSMC, it's a pairwise sequen sequen sequentially Markovo coalescent. Uh, this is the first applied for the human being. We I uh, use that for the first for the uh, uh, for the endangered species. You can say we can construct the population fluctuation in the history from the, uh, the old uh, uh, lineage of the pandas uh, from uh, Alupoda uh, and to the modern pandas. There are two expansion and two bottlenecks, and also use another software uh, methodology we call it. Diffusion approximate for demographic in inference. Uh, you can say there are two divergences. Uh, first divergence is the Chinese first div uh, diverse from the uh, Sichuan population. In Sichuan population, there's another diverging. Uh, the Ming San, the Chung Lai, uh, has been diverging about 3,000 years ago. This is so quite corporate, uh, co. co uh, coordinate with the uh, three uh, genetic structures. So why is the population, it's like this kind of the fluctuation or divergence. Uh, the population diverges. Uh, why is training quite different with this Sichuan population? Uh, we say the first divergence is a phenomenon, uh, uh, glaciations, 3,000 uh, and once, uh, uh, some years ago, uh, that's the first because of this glaciation, the Qingling and the Sichuan diverged 
uh, separated a uh, long time ago. Uh, so the second uh, divergence uh, of in Sichuan population, we, we think is because of the uh, the human uh, activities uh, during the past 3,000 years ago. Uh, the, could you say there was an ancient Shu kingdoms in, 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 in Chengdu at the onwards from the Chengdu to, to Qingming or somewhere. Uh, uh, so what, we also found some local, because the population divergence a long time ago, so we can test it. If there were local adaptation of the different population, uh, of course we get, we, we do, we did get some uh, local adaptation signal, like the two bitter test receptor genes. Uh, so why is it different with this one? Because of the feeling behavior, but different, uh, uh, more leaves in Qingning. Uh, you say that in the bamboo leaves, uh, 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 it contains higher in alkaloids, uh, some major bitter complex, uh, components, uh, than part of the plants of the, like bamboo shoots or others. So this might be the uh, reason uh, for the local adaptation. So uh, as I mentioned that this is a, uh, could be the first one uh, uh, population genomics uh, research in the world uh, so has been applied in different species. So you would say later on, so many species has been uh, done use this kind of methodology uh, way development, uh, like the uh, golden monkeys, uh, Sichuan golden monkey, Minna golden monkey, or fucking, or uh, dolphin, or red panda, or pangolin, or talking, and uh, Etc. Uh, so many species has been uh, uh, has been done uh, use this kind of methodology. So second story I would like to introduce is a uh, uh, red pandas. Uh, I will go in a bit of. Uh, uh, a little bit uh, quicker uh, because of the time limited. So. I know red pandas is very interesting, uh, beautiful species, uh, the John pandas. Uh, uh, in the past, the people thinking they are closely related to the John pandas, belongs to the uh, same uh, family. Uh, however, uh, uh, based on new findings, uh, two species are, are different families. Uh, the pandas, uh, John pandas belongs to the horses and the red pandas uh, separated for that one is uh, Alupoda. Uh, so, and so only once uh, in this family, in the only one species, one genus. Uh, but some scientists think there are two uh, uh, species. Uh, uh, is it just two subspecies or two species? Uh, you will say from that one, Colin Bruce classified to two species of the Himalaya or Chinese, but there's no any evidence of genetic, genetics. Uh, so we use the John Panda methodology, we do the uh, similar work about the red panda, we sequence a lot of the uh, jump, uh, red panda uh, from different populations, uh, including the uh, genome uh, resequence, the mitochondrial genome, and also um, Y chromosome genotyping uh, of the different uh, red panda uh, samples from different uh, area. Uh, what do we find? Yeah, you will say whole genome slips reveal uh, significant genetic divergence. Uh, between the two subspecies, you will see uh, the, 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 the red, the, I'll see uh, that one. Can you see? Uh, the yellow one uh, uh, is quite different with the Sichuan uh, 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 Chinese subspecies, as uh, so a human species in Nepal or so, uh, somewhere. Uh, uh, from the uh, uh, whole genome slips, also we can uh, construct uh, the uh, genetics. Uh, uh, divergence of uh, 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 different species of uh, genetic structure was say that quite different of uh, Himalaya and Chinese, no matter the plot, uh, PCA or genetic structure. Uh, mm. When you look at white slips, uh, also show the two uh, distinct uh, genetic structure of Himalaya and Chinese and uh, from the uh, Maternal mitochondrial DNA genome, you will say two 
uh, significant uh, gen, uh, dif significant uh, differential uh, 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 genetic structure of the Himalaya and the Chinese. Uh, so based on our study, we think the giant pan uh, red panda could be uh, identified uh, to uh, phylogenetic uh, uh, species, like Himalaya red panda or Chinese red panda. You can see different. Uh, also, you can see the different of the uh, <coughs> of the traits, uh, uh, appearance of the pandas' uh, faces uh, and the tails. Uh, uh, Chinese uh, red panda, the face is um, the color is uh, redder and that is the more white and uh, the tails uh, show different. I don't want to go more detail. Uh, Where's this two species uh, as boundary? Uh, finally, we found that uh, uh, in the past, people think it's Lu Jiang uh, would be, uh, but it's not. Uh, so Yalu Jiang Bu uh, could be their boundary. We also constructed uh, the uh, their demographic history of two species is quite uh, similar for the giant pandas. You will say the yeah, red panda has a, uh, uh, two expansion and two botnets. That's uh, quite uh, 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 two species divergent uh, uh, during the penultimate uh, glaciation, also uh, during the, the Great Lake period, the population expansion. Uh, during the last uh, glaciation maximum, maximum, the population come down uh, to similar. So this two, uh, this two species has different kinds of the population history. So we uh, further support, we could uh, classify it as two species, not two subspecies. Uh, uh, another kind of the uh, method uh, we call the fastest Markov to analysis uh, also support our uh, uh, former uh, uh, analysis of that one. There are two uh, several divergences. The first the divergence of two species is about 2020 some years ago. That's because of the phenomenon uh, glaciation and then later on the different kinds of the uh, diversion is related, related to related to that. So the, you can say that different kinds of the red panda has a, a different kinds of the genetic diversity and uh, Himalaya have the lowest, lowest genetic diversity and Chinese has a higher, I uh, don't want to go. Uh, the third story about the tucking, uh, the tucking has been classified as uh, four subspecies, but some people think it's a four species, uh, but no further uh, support, uh, evidence to support their conclusion. So we have done the similar work using the genetic, genetic data to support how many species should be cl cl classify, uh, classified. Uh, so there are two, four subspecies, that's a weighty, taxicolor, tibetana, bit of foridy, etc. Uh, so uh, similar, I uh, don't want more details. Uh, you say uh, uh, we compare the the uh, Tarkin genome with goat. Uh, there are different kinds of the chromosome numbers. Uh, and also, we do the population genomics uh, from different population of different species in different area. Uh, don't want go more de details. There are, uh, also we has done different uh, um, uh, genetics markers. That's awesome sleep X and Y and metal genomics. So what what do we have found? Uh, you say from the outer sum sleep, uh, you you can find that two significant different of the population structure and and uh, and for for the uh, another kind of method uh, you can also find the similar similar ones. Uh, uh, text color and the way they classify together, uh, cluster together, uh, bit 40 and Tibetanas uh, classify, uh, cluster uh, together. Uh, and, and from the X chromosome, uh, similar results uh, we can find. And from Y chromosome uh, genome, uh, we found the similar results. Uh, Tibetanas and text color uh, class uh, separated. Uh, separated. Uh, 
So uh, when you use the FSD genetic diversity label, we can find the significance of two uh, species. Uh, when you was, uh, use the, another uh, method, uh, we call the species denimulation, uh, the, the best model uh, to propose the two uh, species uh, is quite correct. Uh, so finally, we think the talking should be classified uh, two species, uh, species, not four species, and uh, we can call that Chinese talking or Himalaya talking. Uh, also, we found uh, like this one, the Chinese talking, including Qin, uh, uh, including Qingling and the Sichuan sp uh, subspecies, uh, and uh, another two in in the poor and uh, um, Oregon group. Classify another species. Uh, so what the boundary we also found that the the three parallel river, uh, uh, like the Lujiang, Nanchengjiang, and the Jia, Jinshajiang could be the boundary of two species. Uh, to, uh, but there are, uh, in two species, uh, in one of species, there are two subspecies, and uh, you will say that you found the different boundary of the yellow jambu could be the uh, weighty and the text color. And another one, John and John could be bit of and and to be taller. Uh, they, they, they have the this one. Uh, so once we con reconstructed the, the population history, uh, uh, it's quite similar for the giant and the red panda. They have the different the population history and the, they have the divergence in time. It's uh, uh, coordinated the Phenomenate glaciation, uh, uh, glaciation or last uh, glaciation maximate. Uh, I don't want to go deal detail. Also, the divergence is similar to that one. Uh, you say uh, coordinated with the uh, uh, pillow climate change. Uh, so, so the genetic diversity is different. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Himalaya talking uh, has higher uh, uh, genetic diversity than Chinese talking. Uh, also, we did the genetic diversity of the uh, uh, in the species. Uh, in, in Chinese species, Chinese subspecies shows a much lower uh, LD in breeding and genetic road level than others. Uh, so it's quite different of species of two species of the talking. Uh, so this is how to show the you uh, three stories about uh, how genetics uh, could help to reconstruct the, 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 their population history and correlate with the uh, paleo uh, climate change. Uh, so it can be shown that paleo climate change has shaped their uh, history. Uh, population history of a jump uh, uh, endangered species in China. Uh, thank you for your listening. It's the end of my talk. Thank you, uh, Professor Wei Fuwen. And this is a very interesting talk. And uh, uh, Professor Wei uh, developed uh, genomic uh, approaches to uh, reveal how uh, uh, climate change will uh, 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 affect the uh, evolution and the uh, uh, divergence uh, and the population expansion or contractions. Uh, I think this is a very new uh, approaches and uh, have some very important uh, uh, significance and implications uh, when we are studying uh, uh, the impact of climate change in uh, small scales. Uh, what impressed me is that uh, um, in the uh, in the warm period, there are some uh, expansions of the panda and the red panda and uh, the tachyns. So, three species provide strong uh, evidence. Uh, so, with the climate cooling, so population contractions, uh, and uh, yeah, this inter interesting findings are quite consistent with some um, recent studies on the uh, small scales. Thank you very much. We will uh, uh, because of time. Uh, uh, we will uh, have a discussions uh, uh, by the end of uh, all uh, speech. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Thank Professor you. Wei. Yeah. Very okay. interesting, very interesting talk. Thank you. Okay, please. Uh, uh, you, uh, yeah. Okay, I, I will end. Yeah, and the uh, uh, presentation. Now, welcome. Uh,
uh, Professor Charlie Krebs from University of British Columbia. Uh, Professor Charlie Krebs, uh, uh, everybody know, I think, is a very famous uh, uh, ecologist. And uh, I think um, um, most of us uh, 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 study ecology by reading his books. And uh, uh, we are very honored to have uh, Professor Charlie Krebs to give uh, uh, presentations on the, his long-term studies in, in the Yukon uh, Barrier Forest uh, Stations. Uh, his uh, speech title is Climate Change in the Yukon Burial Forest, 50 Years of Study in the Northern Canada. Welcome, Charlie. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Share <laughs> screen. Okay. Share screen. <laughs> yeah, you upload your PPT. Down further, scrape down further. Okay. Where did it go? Oh, way down there. Okay. It's working. Uh, sorry, a little technical difficulty here. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, Jivin. Uh, uh, it's a great honor to be invited to uh, talk to you. Uh, all of my, I want to say hello to all of my Chinese friends whom I haven't seen for quite a while now, and uh, as well as uh, our Australian and American friends. And uh, what I want to do is talk to you today about what we have been doing for the last 50 years in, in Northern Canada and the Yukon, um, and how, how, what our view is, if you like, of the impacts of climate change. Now, how do I get this to go? No, this is not working. Okay, there we are. Now, I want to talk about our study area, which is way up in the, the western part, northwestern part of Canada. It's in the Canadian boreal forest, and the boreal forest uh, extends over basically two-thirds of Canada. And uh, if you, uh, so to speak, walk from, uh, east to, from west to east, it would still look the same over several thousand uh, kilometers of walking. So this is a very big area, and uh, we are up here in the corner. Studying it. Photo of uh, we're studying it in a valley. This is a, a boreal forest in the valley. Above the valley, you can see a tree line. Now we have not studied up there. We have they stayed down in the forested zone, and the forested zone is a patchwork of communities, but, but very simple communities by your standards. Uh, the white spruce, the conifer you see, is basically the only conifer there. Uh, and the shrubs and the small trees, again, there's only two or three species of. And what you see in the landscape is the landscape uh, uh, shaped by fire. So all of the little patches you see are, are patch fires, generally of small scale, that have produced the forest we see in the valley. Now here's another shot of the valley. Now this is a very slow ecosystem, so I want to emphasize that. This uh, picture shows you what would have been a pond when the glaciers receded 8,000 years ago and um, is now slowly uh, coming up. The um, trees you see are probably of the order of 300 years old. They are not very big um, and uh, they're all white fruits. So we have a very simple tree community as well as the shrub community. Now, what's happening to climate change? Here's some data for the last 50 years from the, the weather stations, the government weather stations uh, near our study area. And you can see summer temperatures on average are increasing something like a quarter of a degree per 10 years. And uh, But the thing that is impressive is the year-to-year -year variation is enormous. So even though you've got climate change, You've got a lot of variance, if you like, around the mean. Um, so summer temperatures are going up, but even more severely, uh, winter temperatures are going up. The so winter temperatures are going up about three times faster in this particular area uh, 
than summer temperatures. Now, these are still cold temperatures, as, as you can tell. The average winter is still minus 16, minus 15 degrees Celsius. So this is not a warm climate for much of the year. And the average summer temperature is only 10 or 11 degrees Celsius. So this is not a very warm place. Now, what do we do? First of all, i give just a rule of how I'll structure the talk. The first thing we have to do is to describe the food web. We have a community here in the boreal forest, the forest community, um, and we want to describe the food web, so we did that. And the next question you ask, then given a food web, what species can you concentrate on? Now, I emphasize you can't do everything. I think that's a great thing we must keep pointing out. There is way too much biodiversity out there for you to think you can do everything. And so you have to ask some very specific questions and say, given the time you have available, what questions do you wish to attack? Which questions do you wish to answer? And when you start to define those, you have to say, what hypotheses are driving your study? What are the ex possible explanations of different uh, answers to the questions you have raised? Now, we discussed a lot of this in our book uh, 20 years ago now, which, which is available. Uh, so here's the food web. Okay, so that's the first thing we tried to do and, and look at it. It's a total mess. It's very complicated. If you showed this diagram to a physicist, he would tell you you're completely insane to try to study such a thing. But here we are. There's a plant at this level, herbivores at the central level. And, and predators at the top. But you can see it's highly aggregated. We have all of the insects, which many of you are interested in, uh, in one little box. We have not been able to study them. We have the grasses all in another little box. And again, the botanist among you would be horrified. So we tried to concentrate on the, the species as shown in yellow here uh, to get some idea of what's going on. And let's call them the dominant species uh, in the community. But this you can see the key of this food web is a snowshoe hare. It's eating a lot of different things, and it's getting e eaten by all of the predators. So it's a keystone species. Uh, where am I? I've got to go up on. Whoops. What's happened again here? Now, oh, how did I get this up? Okay. Whoops. I went the wrong way. Now, let me start with the white spruce. Uh, the tree, this big conifer tree. Uh, the trees in our area are of, uh, up to 500 years old. Um, so, and they're not very big. So if you were a forester and you wanted to make your money cutting down trees, this is not the place for you to be. Um, and what happens is white spruce have cone crops. Every now and then they have so-called mass years. And we've got this now over 35 years. You can see some mass years. He said, well, how many cones are on an individual tree? 500. But some years, 2,000, sometimes over 2,500. But you can see these are very sporadic. And this illustrates, again, how this community operates. It is a boom and bust community. So up and down and up and down. And uh, you can see how that has gone on. Now, when we started looking at this, we only have uh, 35 years of data. When we started looking at this, the mass years, those big years where there's lots of cones, and I would emphasize that a lot of things that eat them, the, the seed of white spruce, you know, all the birds like crossbill, the red squirrel, all the rodents, you know, there's a lot of food in, in, in their seed. So what is the interval between these mass years? Um, and if you look at them over the last 35 years, you get this kind of regression now. The statistician among you will be absolutely horrified. We got only seven points on this regression and it took 35 years to get them. And uh, so, you know, my response is, well, we need another 35 years of data to see if this trend is going to continue or whether uh, something else. Now, we know nothing about the physiology, so to speak. What is white spruce thinking about when it has cones and does not have cones? Why does it have these mass series? And uh, we don't know anything about that. Now, the vegetation changes. Just let me summarize very briefly. Um, shrubification, a terrible word. The increase in shrubs, and this is willow and dwarf birch. I'll show you a photo in a little bit. This has been very strong, so this is probably 
the major thing you would see if you walked in this area now and had been there 50 years ago. Tree density and growth is only really small increases in growth of trees. Uh, there's very old age structure. Um, and I'll illustrate that in a moment here. Ground berries, we have studied a lot of the ground berries. Everything, of course, eats the, these ground berries. And there's about half a dozen really quite productive species there. But they're highly variable from year to year. They're just like the spruce cones, you know, up and down and up and down. There's no clear increase over 50 years in berry production, however. Um, so the strongest increase is in the, the shrub, the shrub growth. So here's a picture of one of my graduate students from 30 odd years ago, 25 years ago, Patrick Carey is out in an old burn. Now this is an area that was burnt. We did a fire history of the valley. And this was an area burnt in 1840s, 160 years ago, 170 years ago. And you can see it's not yet recovered to be a, a full forest. And so this is a very slow ecosystem. These are willow and birches here. And you can see Patrick is standing there sort of shoulder high. Now, if we had Patrick up there uh, right now, uh, these willows and birches are now two to three meters tall, so you couldn't even see him. These have increased greatly. The trees have grown a little bit more, but not very much. This tree, for example, at the time this photo was taken would have been 100 years old. So they're very, very slow uh, growing in the system. Now, the main interest we got into here was the snowshoe hair cycle. This is the nine to 10 year cycle that occurs all across the boreal forest ecosystem. And the snowshoe hares are a keystone species in the food web. Everything eats them. So all the predators eat them. So uh, they're very important. And the question we asked is what causes these nine to 10 year cycles? And more importantly, from a point of view of climate change, will these cycles disappear? With climate change, we've had several people talking about that in the literature, that these cycles will disappear. Um, so there's only one way to find that out, and that is to study them. So here's some data. Here is uh, uh, 50 years of data on snowshoe hare numbers. Now, the snowshoe hare is a hare. That is to say, it is not a rabbit. It does not burrow. It turns white in the winter and turns brown in the summer. And they survive only because of their very large ears to listen to the predators that are hunting them all the time. So here's the cycle. We had a fairly big cycle here, but since then, there's no suggestion the cycle is disappearing. Now, again, the statisticians will say you only have five data points, and I think that's a valid thing, but we need another 50 or 60 years to see if there's any trend in, in these nine to 10 year cycles. So as far as I can tell, they go on. Um, regularly, no change. Uh, and uh, if you know from uh, the, the time cycles were described uh, 300 years ago, the predators follow them up and down. Um, and these are the lynx in red and the coyotes in blue and the hair density in yellow. And you can see this is a boom bust cycle again. The, the predators build up and then essentially they. They overcompensate. They, there are too many of them. They destroy basically the the hairs. This large part of the story. Um, so you ask, why does a hair die? It basically is an almost an annual species. It dies in its youth because it gets eaten by a predator. So ninety percent of the death, deaths of hairs are caused by predators eating them. So it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, but the cycle goes on, the lengths and the hair um, is not changed. There's a time lag, of course, between the predator and prey about one to two years. Now, here's one of the major changes that have occurred uh, in, in the 50 years we've been there. This is the Arctic ground squirrel. The Arctic ground squirrel, I guess, like most ground squirrels, is a burrower. Um, and uh, when we started studying them in the 1970s, uh, we didn't have as precise data as we had later on, but here's the hair cycle in green. And they go up and down with the hair cycle. And we started getting good data here, and this, they go down. And um, so why is that? Very simple. The predators come off eating snowshoe hares, and they eat Arctic ground squirrels. But in the year 2000, they fell into what we call a predator pit. That is to say, and you can see there's basically none of them left. 
out in the forest. Now you can still find them. They have not gone extinct because they live in their houses and uh, up in the Alpine that we, we have not studied. But down in the forest where they used to be incredibly common, you cannot see a one of them. And this is because they can't defend themselves against predators because of the shrubbery. You can see it's a little ground squirrel and, and it hears and sees the predators coming. So when you have the shrubs increasing so greatly in growth, they can't see anywhere. And so they live in little colonies. They make alarm calls. But before they can make an alarm call, the predators like coyotes and owls uh, pick them off and basically drive them into a predator pit so they're not left. Now, we've done reintroduction studies here. They all get eaten by predators so that you can't get them back again. This is a major change. The loss, essential loss of this species in this forest ecosystem. The redback vole cycles, again, people have talked about cycles disappearing. And I will, it's again 50 years of data, and the cyclic peaks are in gray here. And I won't go into details of this, but the cycle goes on and on and on and on. And there's no sign of it stopping. In fact, there's a slight sign it's getting more, um, the amplitude is going up. But um, so here's a cyclic, a little rodent species, and it has lovely cycles uh, in spite of climate change. Okay, now here's a, 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 a thing I would like to emphasize. Let's look at energy flow. We have an ecosystem out there. Let's measure something about it uh, in terms of what energy is flowing out of it. And here's a comparison between early on when we started 35 years ago and what the last 10 years shows. And when you look at the, the old, good old days, no shoe hares were pretty big, red squirrels were big, brown squirrels were big, mice and voles were not so big. And the interesting thing I, I like to remind people is what do we worry about <laughs> often in conservation? It's things like spruce grouse, a beautiful bird, moose, um, grizzly bears, this uh, blue line up here, and uh, Anyway, very, very little of the energy flow is going on to those big guys. Now, that's not to say we don't want to keep them in the ecosystem. But when you look at it, they are a minor component of what's going on out there. Now, if you look at the last 12 years, something's happened. The ground squirrels have basically disappeared. The mice and voles have gone up a bit. And again, the other guys are still very weird. The red squirrels have gone up a bit. The hair is down a little bit. But we've lost a major piece of the, if you like, herbivore community, which all of the predators that I've put chew on. <clears throat> okay, so let me try to summarize this a couple more slides. So the boreal forest changes uh, in respect to climate change are very slow. So if you want to know what's going on, which we think is important, it requires long-term monitoring, uh, long-term, you know, talking in units of 50 years and more. The climate is warming, shorter winters mainly. Vegetation is changing slowly, mainly in the shrubs. Now, the bird data, I apologize to the ornithologists, were data deficient. Migratory and resident birds have possibly been changing. We have had nobody who could follow that in our study area. Small mammals, little change in the short term. Um, larger mammals are data deficient, so we do not have the, the nice kind of uh, data that uh, large, large mammals and people in the Serengeti have, they're very expensive to study things like moose. And generally, we don't have that kind of money. Grizzly bears, uh, they're the animals that most people are interested in. But in terms of trying to study them, you got to have the money, and, and we don't have the money. As far as we can tell, nothing is happening. I just can say none of these have gone extinct. If anything, there are probably a few more now than there were before. So for the whole system, it's, there are changes, but I would say they're relatively minor. Now, there are a whole, whole lot of unknowns. The fire cycle, human disturbances. Now, we did a fire cycle study of the valley, and then if you sat down in the valley where we were, you would burn up once every 350 years. So this is not a rapid fire cycle. Now, that's not to say in the future it won't get more rapid, but um, and the fires now that are you read about in the Boreal forests are too often set by people. They're not natural fire. Agriculture is impossible up here. There's nothing in the soil in northern Canada. So if someone tells you 
you should buy a farm in northern Canada, you should run the other way. There is no nutrients in the soil, and anybody who thinks as climate change proceeds, we can start growing wheat in the Yukon, it's not going to happen. There's nothing in the soil. Harvesting, hunting of large mammals, again, that's one of the main things affecting them. Harvesting by First Nations people as well as other hunters. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, under control at the moment, but uh, it's been an unknown for the future. Uh, tree regrowth, as I said, is 100, 200, 300 years. So you'd be crazy if, if someone offers you a forestry company in the Yukon, you would run the other way. There's no way you could ever make any money uh, with these very slow tree growths. Mining is very destructive with small areas, not properly regulated by the government. So these are all unknowns for the future. Um, and so what we have taken here in this very brief uh, talk here has been to um, tell you a very simple approach to discover patterns of change. We need good data. Once we have good data, we have to understand the mechanisms that are behind the patterns we see. And to understand the mechanisms, we need monitoring, good field studies, and a lot of time. So thank you for listening. What did I do? I went off. Ali, thank you very much for your uh, presentations, your long-term study, your uh, field uh, observation data, and uh, provide a very good evidence on how uh, uh, animal communities uh, respond to the uh, climate change. Uh, because uh, in the Arctic areas, people are very concerned about the uh, climate change uh, because uh, temperature increase much higher in the, that region. So this uh, long-term field study and the data are very valuable. Thank you for sharing your studies and your valuable uh, insight into the climate change effect. Okay, thank you. Now oh, we welcome uh, uh, Professor uh, Chris, Christoph uh, Dickman. Uh, he is from the University of Sydney. And uh, he's uh, also an uh, uh, expert on study um, uh, how uh, climate and environment affect uh, uh, very dry, uh, arid uh, environment uh, on the animal population and communities. Now, uh, his uh, topic uh, is a biological consequence of global change in Central Australia, extremely effect in the extremely environment. Welcome. Chris. Thank you, Chivin, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's a great honour to be among everybody, colleagues and friends, um, and be able to contribute to the symposium. So, let me share my screen. Yes, uh, please upload the PPT. Oops. Can everybody see that? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, uh, enlarge, enlarge the screen. Okay, you can yeah start a run, slide the show. Mm. It's as large as it will go on my screen. I hope that's big enough. Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay. So I'll switch gear a little bit from uh, from Charlie's presentation. And uh, rather than talking about a cold environment, talk about an environment that is really at the other extreme. It's a very hot environment in Central Australia. Uh, sorry, Chris, it's still not a, a, a full a full screen. You need to click the slide show. Maybe, yeah, it, it is only partially show, not a full screen. Oh, I need to uh, yeah, upload again. Okay, is, is this any better? Uh, no, it's not a uh, still a part uh, show, not the full screen. Yeah. I think it's okay. You can, yeah, yeah it's, it's quite a, okay. clear. 
Yeah, uh, Grace, I, I, I think you need to show the, the not, not you just uh, uh, share the screen, but not show the, 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 the slides. Okay. So it's okay to continue like this. So yes, I think it, I think it's fine. Okay, I think it's fine. Yeah. yeah Thank I'm you. Sure if it's um, not as large as it should be, but uh, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Um, so the um, similar patterns in uh, in Australia as to those happening in many other parts of the world in respect of warming temperatures. The slide here shows an increase over the last hundred and ten years in the air temperatures and uh, sea, surface te uh, uh, sea surface temperatures in the Australian region. Um, similar patterns, of course, everywhere around the world. In terms of the Australian environment, a recent report indicates that over the last 110 years, the air temperature has risen by nearly one and a half degrees. Rainfall overall has dropped by around 10%, but that is regionally very variable. It's much lower in the south and it's increasing in the north of the country. Uh, there are also effects on stream flow, reduced snow cover and so on. And the oceans too are getting warmer and acidifying. Yeah, but are, sorry, Chris, uh, your uh, slide, that don't, don't move. Don't move. Really? Yeah, what's the problem? Maybe you need to figure out the technically issues. Yeah. I'll come back to. Uh, yeah, you can uh, get a full screen uh, before you log, you 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 upload the the file, the PPT. You can have a full uh, show before you upload. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Is that any better? Yeah, it doesn't move. Yeah. Slide. And slideshow. Is there a shortcut key? Perhaps I, Chris, I think you should see uh, share the screen, not the PPT. Ah, uh, share the screen. Okay. No, okay. no I don't know what the sound is. I wonder. I, I sent um I sent the presentation through yesterday to um Liu Ming. Yes. To, yes. Liu Ming. Yeah, yeah maybe you can. Around. And, yeah, uh, maybe Liu Ming can help you to upload the PPT. But, do you mean are you okay to okay yeah uh chris uh we'll uh, ask Liu Ming to help you yeah okay. sorry about this folks i'm not quite sure what's happening at this end so <laughs> it's kind of coming. this will uh, <laughs> this will solve the problem so if we could scroll down to the third slide please i, I can do it from here Let's see okay okay you, you can go this way okay <laughs> fine <laughs> Could we scroll down to the third slide? I can't move them from here. Yeah, maybe, yeah, ask uh, Liu Ming help you, okay, to, yeah. to upload. Then you put his name to Liu Ming. Okay. Uh, and you put his name to Liu Ming, then you give it to him, okay? Uh, I can, I think I can show the PDF for him. I think I, maybe it, it is okay. Yeah. Oh, it's a PPD, okay. Uh, uh, it's a PDF warrant. Okay, yeah, uh, Chris, you, you can, uh, uh, yeah, send to the PDF warrant. Yeah, 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 So just to uh, indicate that Australia is uh, experiencing similar problems to other parts of the world with respect to increasing temperatures, increased uh, variance in rainfall regimes, and it's experiencing uh, a range of droughts, um, flood events, um, increased fire risk, and so on, much as uh, other parts of the world, including China's floods um, a couple of years ago. And what I'd like to do is to look at the effects of this Great variance in the in the climate um, in regards to the fauna of Central Australia. Let's scroll down, please. So what I'd like to do is to talk about the effects of the 
It's great uh, climate variability on the biota, particularly focusing on the small mammals of Central Australia. And see if we can uh, look up to the future to see if there are ways that we can predict and manage what, uh, what we might expect to see. But keep going, please. So the world deserts, first of all, the world deserts cover a, a large part of the globe. I'll be talking primarily about the arid and semi-arid rangelands that occur in the, uh, over the bulk of the Australian continent. It's the light yellow and darker yellow colours in this slide. They obviously cover a large part of the world. They contain a lot of the world's population too, over a third. Characteristics of desert environments are obviously low rainfall, but it's also very variable. There are extremes of temperature. If you're in the cold deserts, you're looking at temperatures that range from minus 40 to plus 40, such as in the Gobi Desert. In the hot deserts, you're looking at temperatures that range from minus 10 to more than 50 degrees C. And in the arid and semi-arid regions, the precipitation to evaporation transpiration ratio is usually much less than 0.5. So we're looking at very dry environments here most of the time. How do these desert situations operate? 1973, a model was put forward by Emmanuel Monnier that suggested that rain was the primary driver. So in the top figure here, rainfall, heavy rainfall in particular, falls. It acts on the reserve in the soil that uh, stimulates the germination and growth of seeds, of roots, and uh, other plant growth. So this pulse of productivity. Pulse of productivity is short-lived. It dies off. Some of it gets returned into the reserve part of the system. From a consumer point of view, this results in a boom and bust dynamic shown in the bottom graph. So what I'd like to do is to Look at the boom and bust dynamic as it applies to this part of the world, to the Simpson Desert shown by the red star here. Simpson Desert is a large area in Central Australia dominated by hummock grassland, the green in the, uh, in the slide. It's an area that uh, has low rainfall on average, 150 to 250 mils a year. Temperatures that go up to more than 50 degrees C. We've been working there since 1990, so we've got um, not quite as many years on the uh, on the clock as uh, Charlie has in the Yukon, but uh, we're coming up to uh, 33, 34 years next year, with large numbers of captures of a, a range of species of mammals, lizards, frogs, um, not so much on the bird front, but we've attempted to look at um, invertebrates and plants as well. What I'd like to do is to look at the implications of the variable climate on the mammals in particular. There are lots and lots of implications, and I'll try to pick out just four that deal with population eruptions, the way that the animals attract resources, the flexibility of their resource use, shifts in population structure, and then go on to look at some further implications in terms of wildfires, invasive species, and loss of refuges. So the first implication of a variable climate is that you get booms and busts in consumer populations. So this graph here shows the population dynamics of two species of native rodent. The sandy inland mouse in the top graph, spinifex hopping mouse in the bottom. And you can see that after every big rainfall event, shown by the blue arrows, there's an increase in the populations of these rodents. It's about a six month lag, and that's because it takes a little bit of time for the rain to turn the, uh, the increase in plant growth into seeds and other products the animals can use. And the animals then turn them into, into recruitment into the populations. In the next graph, a similar pattern is shown for the top species. The Australian arid areas are unusual in that they're dominated in terms of numbers of species by marsupials. So here is a pattern of growth, pattern of population traces for two species of marsupials. The top species, the Mulgara, is a carnivore. It eats the rodents. It does well after big rains as well, and that's largely because it feeds on the rodents that have themselves in turn increased because of the prior rainfall. The lag here is a little longer, around 10 months, simply because it takes longer for Mulgaras to turn all the rodents into, uh, into offspring. 
The bottom graph is a smaller insectivorous marsupial, a dunnart. Its population trace is quite different. It declines after big rains. When the areas flood between sand dunes in the desert environment, the animals drown in their burrows and the populations decline, often for quite long periods. So there's a difference in the dynamics um, in, the, in the different species, depending on these different aspects of their biology. The second implication of the variable climate is that you can't stay put. If resources are running out, you need to be very mobile. The table here indicates for three species <coughs> of rodents, the long range movements that are made during dry periods and during or after rain. For two of the three species, there is an increase in their movements post rain. These are big increases. These are bearing in mind very small animals. So the, uh, the movements of five or six kilometers after rain are really quite significant. And an important thing about this is not just that they increase their movements, their direction, they move towards where it has rained. Further implication is that you need to be flexible in your resource use. Here are the two species, again, the hopping mouse and the sandy inland mouse. There's a big difference between the diets in dry periods, the busts, and the non drought periods, the booms, particularly with respect to invertebrates. So these are not classic granivores as in other parts of the world. They switch diets depending on circumstances. The further implication, implication four, is that there are shifts in genetic structure between periods. During dry periods, the animals retreat to small refuge areas in the desert, and in these small refuges, they become genetically differentiated. These are overcome when it rains and the animals are able to move out into the wider desert environment and there's panmictic breeding that happens once again. So lots of population implications for, um, for this variable climate. A further very important one is that wildfire follows big rain events. This is a trace going back to 1910, showing that after big rainfall events, there are big fires. There's a stimulation of productivity, this dries off, and then it's prone to lightning strikes that lead to big fires. <clears throat> in the Simpson Desert, in 2001-2002, over a quarter of a million hectares of our immediate study area burnt, including many of our grids. The fire return interval is about 25 years. So the spinifex grass now really burns very readily and very quickly. Some of the effects are quite dramatic. You can see in the, uh, in the top right figure here, after a fire has gone through, there is virtually no vegetation at all, it's bare sand. And what is left is often very patchy. The effects on small mammals are quite dramatic. This is uh, a trace of population um, capture rates, much higher in the unburned patches of the desert than in the burnt. Similar patterns are seen for the reptiles. If you look at uh, just one example here of a reptile, a stripy lizard in the next, in the next slide, a very similar pattern of many more animals in the unburnt areas as compared with the burnt. So wildfire has a detrimental effect on populations of many species. But there is a further effect. This is implication number six. The predators follow the fires. When you get a fire, Introduce predators like foxes and cats move in and you get a lot of activity at the interface between the burnt and the unburnt habitat. In unburnt habitat, the predators are usually fairly scarce. But when a fire goes through and opens up the, the vegetation, the predators move in and take a lot of small mammals that are left. If you look at the diets of the predators, there are very big differences between the different phases of the rodent population booms and busts. They're eaten all the time, but the biggest increase in, the, in rodents in the re representation of foxes and cats is when the populations have peaked and the numbers are coming down again. So perhaps much like Charlie's um, Arctic squirrels, the ground squirrels, predation is a key factor in this environment. Summing up some of, the, uh, some of these interactions, big rainfall events, lead to increases in productivity of the vegetation. Small mammals like rodents increase dramatically. 
This leads to an increased risk of fire, and there is an additional risk of predators coming in <coughs> to take advantage of the flush in numbers of the, of the small mammalian consumers. And this is exacerbated if a fire happens at the same time. Trying to put all of this together, <coughs> we've produced some structural equation models, still a work in progress, um, to indicate the strength of the interactions and the drivers that, um, that drive them. So there are lots of things I haven't mentioned in the system here, but um, top predators um, coming down from the top-down effects and bottom-up effects from the, uh, the effects of big rains. <coughs> If you look at the last hundred years, there has been an increase in rainfall events, not just in the, the average rainfall, but in the magnitude of the really big extreme events. And there seems to be a shortening of the period between the timing of these events. If you take this information and assume that it's going to, uh, going to happen increasingly over the next century, you can make some predictions based on the structural equation models. This is just one uh, of many example scenarios looking at the next 100 years. If you assume that there are going to be more extreme rainfall events <clears throat> and wildfires, we can expect there will be a decrease in the amount of the hummock grass or spinifex. There will be a decrease in the amount of spinifex seed that's produced. And this is a key driver <clears throat> of population dynamics. But if you factor in what's happening with the predators in the bottom part of the graph, Rodent abundance really is quite dependent on the presence of predators. We've looked at other components of the system. Um, ants were, uh, were shown. There's no, no indication that ants are doing uh, very poorly. They do very well after big rains. But there are other factors that, um, that, that come in after big rainfall events. These bring in invasive species, such as cane toads, invasive grasses, um, they're all pigs, foxes, and so on. On the other hand, droughts can bring the destruction of refuge areas if they go on too long. And from what um, the modeling suggests, from what we've seen so far, climate change is very likely to exacerbate these effects. So just to sum up some of the, um, the key trends that we've seen, is that rainfall is clearly a major driver of population dynamics of consumers from rodents right through. Small desiurid marsupials are unusual in that they decline after heavy rains. So very divergent effects of big rainfall events. Wildfires are likely to become more frequent than they currently are. And there are interactions <clears throat> between big rainfall events, between fires that clear the vegetation, and invasive predators that move in in the wake of big rains. And, uh, and fires. Climate change is likely to see an exacerbation of these already extreme effects, making it quite a problematic challenge for, uh, for us to try to stop further species going extinct in this environment. In Central Australia, anyway, is a problematic environment for people, let alone for trying to manage the wildlife that occurs there. Well, in any long-term study, a lot of people have contributed. A lot of thank yous to many people. Um, thank you again to Chivin for the opportunity to speak here at, uh, at this symposium. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Chris, for your excellent presentations. Uh, uh, you are uh, long-term and system studies provide a very clear evidence on how uh, climate change affect the outbreaks of uh, small mammals and predators and uh, the other uh, animal uh, species. Uh, this uh, information is very valuable in uh, uh, pest management and uh, wildlife conservation in Australia. So this is a very impressive study. Thank you for your sharing your uh, uh, studies and uh, your data. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next we will we will welcome Professor Marshall Hollyoak uh, 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 from the University of California, Davis, uh, give a, a presentation on the effects of climate change on spatial uh, dynamics. 
Master Holik is uh, also a member of the our society and uh, and uh, also senior editor of our journal Integrative Zoology, and uh, he uh, made a uh, good contribution to the society and the journals. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, now welcome uh, uh, Marcel to give a uh, uh, presentation on his uh, studies. Welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Professor uh, Zhang Zibin, for inviting me to present here. I feel honored to be among such distinguished speakers. Uh, and let me see if I can get the right screen. Can you see my slides? And is that a yes. good view? Okay. Yes, very clear, very clear. Okay, good. Um, so uh, I, I gave the title for this talk when I hadn't quite decided what I was going to talk about. And uh, I uh, decided to uh, make this talk about uh, some work that I have collaborated on at my own university uh, for close to 20 years now. And it's a long-term study of plant-insect interactions and trying to see when are spatial dynamics Im important uh, was one of our initial aims. And that changed into asking, when is climate change important to, to spatial dynamics? What kind of weather variables are involved? And how do they affect the dynamics of uh, a system in which we focus on a, uh, a species of herbivorous insect and then look at the effects on other uh, species? I'll talk first about some food web interactions, and then I will expand it to talking about some long-term population dynamics of the system and hopefully bring it all together. Okay, so you've already heard a lot about the effects of climate change. We've heard that extreme events are happening more frequently. Hot extremes are more frequent. Cold extreme weather is less frequent in general. Heavy precipitation events, we have a high confidence that they have increased globally. We're getting longer heat waves and accompanied by droughts and fires. And we're often getting uh, flooding events accompanied uh, by cold, cold weather or just simply uh, longer or more extreme flooding events occurring. The effects are, uh, as with temperature change, are more extreme at high latitudes. So people studying things in uh, where Charlie works up in uh, uh, northern Canada are seeing more uh, stronger effects than in more tropical regions or temperate regions. And um, beyond temperature, we are seeing effects on rainfall. And I'll focus in a little bit here and say that um, the patterns of rainfall change are expected to vary enormously around the globe. Again, they're expected to be more extreme at uh, more extreme latitudes, so towards the poles. In places like where I'm talking about today in California, the prediction of climate models and recent observations is that we actually have drier weather on average. OK, so uh, I'll revisit that later. I am going to talk about uh, this insect. It's called uh, um, Ranchman's tiger moth. Um, and we mainly study the larvae, the caterpillars of this species. And it feeds primarily on a single species of uh, shrub, uh, perennial shrub. The moth has one generation a year. It has important interactions with parasitic wasps, uh, insect viruses, bacula viruses, and ants. Uh, and I'll mention primarily the ant predation today and the plant and insect interactions. And I heard Charlie mention grizzly bears, uh, and I heard uh, uh, Wei Fu Wen mentioned uh, panda bears that are, of course, not bears. And our insects are also not bears, but they are called woolly bears. I actually recently got an email from a, gradu a potential graduate student 
who told me he was greatly interested in mammalogy and wanted to work on woolly bears. Uh, I, I worried about his potential as a graduate student, given that our woolly bears are actually these woolly caterpillars here, the larva of our insect uh, here. So they have a popular name of woolly bears. Uh, like Charlie, we have about a 35 year record of studying uh, this system, primarily just from Professor Vic Carbon, uh, who is an entomologist and studies plant insect interactions uh, at my university. And we've had quite a lot of graduate students and postdocs who have worked on this system uh, over the years. We study this system uh, at a site that's about one hour north of uh, San Francisco at the Bodega Marine Laboratory. Uh, we are interested in terrestrial environments and uh, across a distance of about, uh, Zengi, perhaps you can mute yourself. Uh, the people, the police is your uh, phone. It's done. Thank you. So uh, we have to, um, 11 sites where we have uh, chosen to study local populations. And these are places where we can fairly regularly find uh, insects. They vary in how wet the sites are. We have wet marsh sites, which remain wet almost in all years. And then we have sand dune sites that in wetter years have um, fairly good vegetation and in dry years they dry out quite a lot and we do see local extinctions of the insect but not the plant uh, in those years and sometimes the plant is grazed to be having no edible matter uh, on it in those dry years and uh, you can see that here with uh, in a couple of dry years, 2009, 2010, in the dry sites at the top here, we saw extinctions uh, of our caterpillars. The, and this is sort of an annual spring census on caterpillars per bush. And uh, at the wet sites, numbers declined, but the populations did not go extinct. Okay, And the system functions as a source sink dynamic. And the wet sites act as population sources. The dry sites act as population sinks. In the uh, late spring, when the caterpillars are large, we see them uh, moving around. And we can actually study their movement. And we chose to do this in one case by just watching them uh, cross the road. We would walk up and down the road that goes across the middle of our study area, and we would count the numbers of caterpillars moving and whether they were moving from wet to dry sites. Uh, and what we found was that disproportionately over a few days, the caterpillars were moving exactly that way from wet to dry sites. It was rare that we would see caterpillars going the other way, and they would usually not stop and settle on bushes until they reached dry sites. The, if we put caterpillars in the middle of the road, they would tend to gain towards to, to settle on the dry sites when, uh, when they reach them and not stop on the wet sites for marked caterpillars. So there seems to be a preference for moving to dry sites late in the development of these caterpillars. So we were curious as to why there would be this movement to drier sites at cer certain times of year. And we know that um, rainfall in our sites is important to the abundance of our caterpillars. This is the change in abundance from one year to the next plotted against the number of large rainfall events. The rainfall events, because it's not just the average precipitation that matters, it's sort of how wet the ground is, and the number of rainfall events is a, a better measure of that in this system, it turns out. So more rain, means more caterpillars in this system. Uh, and uh, that's true across uh, quite a lot of years. And 
We know in general, and this is an old study that I was involved in, 1998, uh, we uh, Brad Hawkins and I went out and started looking for long-term population data of insect herbivores. And we looked at what was the effect of deviations in rainfall, with zero being average rainfall, on the average abundance of insect herbivores. And we expect that when plants are have a lot of water, they're going to make better food for insect herbivores. It's a very simple hypothesis. Uh, Christopher already talked about the effect of rainfall on um, uh, speech in, in his system where you get pulses of productivity after drought that some species can benefit from. In the especially wet uh, pe periods, we see that we get above average abundance of our insect herbivores. It happened without a time delay in terms of whole years. It was in the same year. And then in, in especially dry periods, you can see that populations of the insects tended to decline. OK, so we expected to see that. And we know that effect does occur in our system. Um, on the average abundance of the things. I didn't have a good graph of that to show you, but just to say when it's wetter, we do get more of our insect herbivores. We were interested in the effects on other species in this system. And I'm gonna focus in on one predator, which is one of the most abundant and consistently present predators in our system. It's a, uh, a native ant that's predatory uh, and the ant tends to favor wet areas. It's in higher abundance there. Um, it is present in drier areas as well, but at lower abundances. Okay, so that was sort of an, gave us an idea that this might be something to do with why the dry habitats are preserved in this system. We examined the effects of precipitation on plant growth and uh, we looked at the direct effects on the herbivores as well, okay, and I just told you that. But we also looked at the uh, production of leaf litter. The reason we're interested in leaf litter is that when these caterpillars get large, they drop to the ground and they pupate and hide, they hide and pupate in leaf litter. We had the idea that when there is more leaf litter, there might be more hiding places from ants. And we uh, expected more plant growth, more leaf litter produced in wet sites. That leads to um, uh, better protection potentially from ants, and you would end up with sort of a net positive effects on the on the caterpillar abundances. Okay, and the ant abundance also varies with precipitation. If it's too wet, the ant abundance declines. Uh, ants are recruited um, uh, into leaf litter uh, regularly, and more so when there's more of it. So that's even more ants recruited into more leaf litter. It turns out, and they stay there much longer. So that could counter the effect. So whether we get a net positive or negative effect on the caterpillars here is not clear. And note this is a, a non-trophic effect. It's an effect of, if there is an effect on caterpillars, and it's an effect through the predators that we're talking about, and via uh, the plants producing leaf litter. So a somewhat strange mechanism here, but an interesting one. If we look at the survival of uh, ca caterpillars, when we put them out in a standardized way, a standardized number of ants, we find that caterpillars survive better in the wetter sites that have more leaf litter. Okay. And we put the same amount of leaf litter in controlled containers as we saw in the field to look at this. And so if there are more hiding places uh, from wet litter, then uh, that could enhance the survival of caterpillars, okay? So that seems possible. But when we did this under more natural circumstances in the field, we found the opposite, that 
caterpillar survival was actually greater in dry sites than in wet sites. And the reason for this is um, that the wet litter under the longer term field situation actually became compacted down and there was then less good hiding place for the, uh, the caterpillars. They could be found more easily and uh, so uh, there was lower survival of caterpillars in the wet situations. Okay, and on average, the dry sites also have less ants, so their survival was even greater. So you're talking about a difference between being up here in dry sites versus being down here in wet sites. So it sort of accentuated the difference. Okay, and overall, we found that uh, there was this much greater survival on average in uh, uh, almost 100% survival of our caterpillars in. Uh, the dry sites, uh, and we did a control of removing the litter to show that it was an effect of the litter here as well, and the effect goes away basically. So we're pretty confident it's to do with litter and amputation uh, in this uh, um, series of experiments. So overall, it seems that there is an effect of precipitation that is uh acting through litter production and it has different effects in a complex way in dry and wet sites okay so let me turn to thinking about the long-term dynamics of this system if we look at our numbers of caterpillars over time they bounce up and down as does the precipitation in the system. And there seems to be some correspondence between the peaks of rainfall and peaks of, peaks of caterpillars, but in quite a loose way. And it took some fairly good time series analysis to pick this apart. And um, looking at this, my graduate student, uh, Adam Pepe, uh, said that it looks like there's a change around year 2000. In years prior to that, we had seen some very wet winters uh, that were El Nino years and some drier than average uh, winters that were La Nina years. So through um, an El Nino cycle, we thought we were seeing changes. And we looked for effects of El Nino cycles on these uh, caterpillars as well. And we actually didn't find them for that. We found a different effect in the end, but uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So. Um, if you look at uh, the precipitation change, you find that it's strongly correlated with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation has been shown by climatologists to have made a change around about year 2000. The, uh, the oscillations became shorter after year 2000, it was no longer a decadal oscillation in the uh, North Atlantic and so North Pacific. And uh, the, uh, there seemed to be some changes in the period, sorry, the, uh, the amplitude of the oscillations as well, find my words. So um, we were curious as to whether this could explain our, re our results and um, so set about investigating that. We did that using wavelet spectro uh, spectrograms, okay? And the brighter colors here, uh, the redder colors, uh, the warmer colors, I should say, show uh, the highest uh, that, um, strength of uh, evidence for a particular period, okay? And you can see that prior to year 2000, the warmest period seemed to be about a two year oscillation going on. And then there was some kind of change here where we've gone to something like a four to six year period occurring after year 2000 or 2004 ish uh, by then. If we look at the precipitation changes, we see this uh, short period prior to 2000 and not much after that. 
If we put together the time series and look at the coherence between the caterpillars and the precipitation, basically how correlated they are, we see that there are strong correlations uh, that uh, with a slightly longer period after uh, 2004 than prior to it is what occurs. And um, we took these patterns and looked also at things like the strength of density dependence, whether density dependence was delayed or not, and we built a time series model. And we were actually able to predict the abundances very well using these kind of shifts in period of the, uh, um, the rainfall that we were getting. So we're, we're actually fairly confident that these changes are real and that they have quite good predictive power within these time series. And there's an ecology letters paper about that that Adam is the, Adam Pepe was the lead on. Um, so uh, Charlie showed us these diagrams, and these piqued my interest when they came up. Around year 2000, Arctic ground squirrels stopped showing uh, they declined in abundance. The snowshoe hare seemed to have had less of oscillations after that time. The redback vole showed the opposite. There's a seem to be a switch though that's around year 2000. I think you might have the same kind of thing going on as well. It also occurs in uh, Pacific salmon populations, which is where we got the idea from in the first place. So it may be it is actually a shift in the climate dynamics that occurred around about year 2000 and it is producing a shift in, our, in the, the system. In our system, we now see more prolonged droughts and we don't see such intense wet winters. That, thinking back to our um, results where we had dry years producing local extinction of caterpillars and wet sites for sources, dry sites for sinks. We expect an increase in the intensity and frequency of sink populations. And so this, the movement of caterpillars becomes increasingly important for their persistence. And uh, we see this change in the uh, cycles of the system as well, which, uh, you know, the amount of years we have for that is only something like, uh, I think, 15 years of data uh, since the switch. So not too long, but it seems to be quite well borne out by the time series models. And uh, so what this all leads us to wonder is how general are these kind of dynamics? Are we going to see changes in other systems? You know, I, I showed you Charlie's um, dynamics here. I, I think are fascinating to know whether they're driven by similar things. Um, and perhaps reconstructing endogenous and exogenous drivers is a way of starting to look at those long-term dynamics in a way that is very familiar to people like Charlie and Zhang Zibin, for example. It's how Zhang Zibin and I first connected in our common interests on these. Um, so I'll end by saying this. Uh, in the news, uh, back, in the nine, uh, back about five years ago, there were some stories about whether our caterpillars uh, can predict weather. And what I've shown you is actually, no, they don't predict weather. They tell you what the weather was. When weather was wetter, they did better and there were more of them and they more and people saw more of them. So they're not predicting the weather. They're responding to the weather. So thank you very much. And I'll hand it back to uh, Zheng Zibin. Thank you, uh, Marcel. A very interesting uh, story about the woolly bear, right? Tiger moose. <laughs> so, uh, yes, very clear uh, uh, observations on the uh, relationship between uh, uh, wet weather, dry weather, and the and the uh, population dynamics of the insects. And uh, more interesting is uh, that. Uh, uh the their uh, special movement you know uh uh is have a different uh, response response to the climate change yeah very interesting very interesting so we will discuss uh, later uh, on the common issues we will concern 
Okay, uh, we we have not the, uh, we will not have a, a break, but we we'll carry on our uh, speech. Uh, next, we we'll welcome Professor Wang Zhiheng from the Peking University. Um, uh, Wang Zhiheng uh, is a, a famous scientist studying uh, plant ecology uh, and climate change. So we are very honored to uh, invite him to give a presentation. Uh, with the title Conservation of Chinese Plant Diversity and the Global Change. Welcome, Professor Wang. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear. Uh, yes, the screen is also good. Now okay. we can start. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for Professor Zhang uh, providing for this uh, very good opportunity uh, to share some of uh, my research. Um, uh, several of the uh, previous talks actually give very uh, good uh, examples in uh, in the responses of uh, uh, mainly animals to uh, climate change. And uh, um, what I'm working on is the uh, potential influences of climate change, both in the past and in the future, could influence uh, plant distributions uh, in China, mainly, and uh, uh, how we could uh, uh, better conserve or protect plants under future uh, climate changes. Um, I will um, uh, talk uh, in this uh, four uh, sections mainly. Um, first, I will give a very brief background about uh, what we have been doing. Um, uh, many of the uh, uh, studies actually have been uh, carried out to uh, evaluate the potential influences of uh, uh, climate change on species distributions and, and species diversity. And many of these uh, studies have been carried out in uh, Europe, North America. Uh, and uh, if we uh, look at uh, the studies in Asia, uh, the number of studies are relatively uh, 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 short. Um, and this is a, a, a uh, evaluation uh, from uh, 2015. I didn't update it since then. Um, um, but uh, uh, in China, uh, how climate change and land use change may affect plant distributions and plant diversity uh, remains one of the uh, 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 unanswered questions. Um, if we look at the recent uh, literature, um, so many of the studies actually demonstrated different responses of species uh, to climate change. In some regions, people found that uh, species are moving uh, up upslope uh, in response to climate uh, in, to climate change. For example, in uh, European Alps and in uh, some other uh, uh, areas. Uh, but some studies uh, found that. Uh, species tend to move downward in response to climate to climate change. For example, in California, some some uh, uh, some authors found that plant species tend to move downward due to uh, climate change. Um, in China, um, in the last a few years, we have collected uh, uh, lots of data, uh, including the uh, uh, specimen records and uh, and the historical uh, uh, community surveys. Um, also, in the last few years, we also uh, resurveyed some of the mountains. Uh, one of the examples is, is uh, Gunga Mountain, uh, which is located in southwestern China. Uh, this is actually one of the global biodiversity hotspot. Um, in this mountain, uh, we uh, collected the historical specimens and uh, and uh, 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 community surveys, uh, and also we resurveyed this mountain during uh, 2017 to, to 2019, and then we divided all the data uh, into two periods uh, before 1988 uh, and after that, after 1988. Um, the year 
1988 uh, is actually the year uh, when the climate warming started to be very uh, uh, significant in this in this uh, mountain. Um, and uh, based on our analysis, then, then we found that <clears throat> um, many of the species uh, be, uh, between these two periods, many of the species actually uh, moved upslope. Uh, this uh, this trend is shown by this uh, blue uh, triangles. Uh, actually, uh, specifically, about sixty four percent of the species moved upslope. Um, but there are also some species moved downward. Uh, that's uh, twenty percent of the species that we studied uh, during these two periods. Um, and we found that in this mountain, uh, this, the plant species with different uh, growth forms moved uh, or responded differently to climate change. The herbaceous species uh, uh, moved upslope much faster than the woody species in response to climate change. And also the species with different seed dispersal types uh, respond also differently. Um, for, uh, for the species with the autocory uh, dispersal uh, type, the, um, these species tend to move downward, while other species tend to move uh, up, up, up slope. And also uh, between different families, their elevational uh, redistributions uh, differed very significantly. Uh, for uh, for Bazi, uh species, most of them, or all of them, actually tend to move uh, downward, while for uh, for this family, Liliazi species, they tend to move upslope during the last uh, few decades. Um, and then uh, the question that we are interested in is that why uh, the responses of plant species to uh, climate change uh, are so different across different mountains? Then we try to uh, explore uh, the, the correlations between the species responses to uh, several of the different, uh, several of different uh, uh, variables, including climate change that the species experienced that's temperature change and uh, precipitation change, and uh, the climatic adaptation of species. Um, that actually reflects the climatic uh, effects on species distributions, which means that which uh, climatic factor are the are more important in determining the global distribution of the species. And then we also included the properties of species uh, that's the uh, uh, morphological traits, mainly, of the species. And also the properties of the mountains, including the mountain size, the locations of the mountains. Um, and then we found quite interesting the uh, temperature change experienced by the species uh, is not very significant in explaining species responses. But the precipitation changes experienced by the species has a significant has a significant effect, um, and more importantly, we found that the adaptation of species to climate, uh, representing the climate effect on species distributions, are quite important in, in explaining the responses of species. Um, this suggests that um, uh, the uh, 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 the tolerances of species to different clim uh, to different climate uh, variables actually have uh, significant uh, influences on how species respond to uh, climate change. Um, and also, we found that different families and different genera have uh, different responses significantly. And also, we found the mountain size has a very significant influence on species responses uh, to climate change. Um, I will show this uh, effect uh, in, put in, in some examples. Uh, here, we show uh, how the uh, adaptation of uh, uh, the climatic adaptation of plants to precipitation and temperature uh, influences their responses to climate change. Uh, we found that if for, for, for the species, 
um, uh, if their distributions are more strongly determined by temperature uh, at the global scale, then they tend to um, uh, move downward in, re in response to climate change in the past a few decades. And that shows uh, by the uh, red line and red points. But if the species are more strongly, if the distributions of the species are more strongly determined by precipitation at the global scale, then they tend to move upslope. Uh, uh, as that's shown, that is that's shown by the uh, blue uh, lines. Um, besides the climate change, actually in the last a few decades, especially since 1999, uh, China has, uh, has, uh, conducted, uh, uh, intensive ecological restoration. And we compared the, uh, climate change impacts, including the precipitation changes and temperature changes, um, uh, and also the effect of ecological restoration, uh, to the vegetation dy dynamics in China. We found that in most regions of China, uh, the ecological restoration has stronger correlations with the uh, uh, vegetation dynamics, uh, which suggests that uh, ecological restoration may have dominated the uh, vegetation dynamics in most uh, regions in China. And we found that in the regions where ecological restoration has a stronger effect on vegetation dynamics, um, the uh, the plant diversity actually tend to increase uh, in the mountains. For example, in in Changbai Mountain, uh, in in uh, Xiaotai, which is very close to Beijing, and in uh, Taibai Mountain, which is in central China, in Qinling, uh, in these areas along the elevational gradients of these mountains, plant diversity increased significantly from 2000 to 2019. And these actually are based on a uh, resurvey of the communities. Um, but in areas where climate change has a stronger effect on, on the vegetation dynamics than ecological, ecological restoration, then we found actually the plant diversity along the elevational gradients of these mountains tend to decrease. Um, that's, uh, uh, Gonga mountain that we have resurveyed. And that's another mountain called Wei uh, Mountain in south uh, eastern China. In fact, in these two mountains, the species diversity along the elevation of grain tend to decrease significantly in the last uh, uh, about twenty years. Um, and uh, uh, climate change uh, can also influence the uh, status of the uh, species, um, according to the. IUCN uh, red list. Uh, actually, this IUCN red list provides a very important tool for conservation. Um, and uh, this uh, IUCN red list has been uh, evaluated based on four major uh, criteria. Uh, that's A, B, C, D, E. Sorry that I didn't translate this uh, because it's a picture. I didn't translate this into English. But it, it's... Um, uh, the IOC in red list are evaluated by based on these five criteria. Um, and uh, the identify the threatened species are also based on this. And uh, um, the threatened species, uh, based on the criteria, uh, all the species are uh, evaluated as uh, least concerned, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, and extinct. Um, these three levels are normally treated as threatened species and are, are very important for the conservation, uh, uh, in, in, in conservation, both in research and practice. In the last about 10 years, uh, or a few years, um, China has finished a very, uh, dramatic, a very, um, uh, big achievement in the evaluation of the, uh, of the uh, threatened status. Of the species of plant species. In 2017, there's a very important paper published. In this study, they evaluated uh, 35,000 plant species according to the IOCN uh, red list criteria. 
and uh, they identified about 3,800 plant species as threatened. That's these three uh, categories. However, in this evaluation, um, uh, people actually considered only the status of the species uh, in the past, not under the future climate change scenarios. Then our results suggest that um, in under the future climate and uh, global uh, 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 climate and land use changes, uh, the species diversity may uh, may uh, have uh, uh, high risks in some regions. For example, in uh, in this mountain called Nanling Mountain, in this region, uh, both species diversity and phylogen phylogenetic diversity may have high risks of uh, great uh, diversity loss under future global changes. While in southeastern uh, part of the uh, Tibetan Plateau, uh, species diversity may uh, may uh, benefit, uh, or may increase, and these regions may act as refugees under future climate change. And they, they do actually have been found to be refugees for plant diversity in, since, last, since the last glacial maximum. Um, then we uh, evaluated the uh, distribution changes under future uh, uh, climate and land, and land use changes, uh, and then we we evaluated their status of uh, of uh, threatened uh, threatened status according to the IUCN Red List A three criteria. Um, this criteria uh, evaluates the uh, changes in in uh, the area of occupancy or the extent of occurrence or habitat quality of the species, uh, both in the past and in the future. Um, and they also have quantitative uh, thresholds uh, that we can use to evaluate if a species can be evaluated as vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. Um, based on our evaluation, we found that um, quite a few species may be evaluated as, as threatened. Uh, so we found that under the most benign scenarios, that's RCP 2.6 and food dispersal scenario, we found about 1300, uh, 1400 um, woody plant species will be evaluated as threatened under future global change, uh, uh, global changes. And most importantly, uh, these, uh, uh, species list of uh, threatened species do not overlap too much with what we have published uh, or with what uh, uh, this, these authors have published in 2017. You see, um, in this list, they identified uh, 1,500 woody species as threatened. Um, and uh, uh, the number is slightly higher than what we shown under the, the most uh, benign uh, scenario. But the overlap between these two lists are very uh, small. Um, and this small overlap uh, 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 remains the same uh, across different uh, scenarios of, of the simulations. Um, this suggests that uh, if we don't consider the uh, potential impacts of future global change on, on threatened species, we may miss a lot threatened species. And if we pull these two lists together, uh, in total, we found that uh, about uh, 25 to uh, 35, uh, 30, 32 species, 32% 30, well, species will be threatened uh, under uh, global uh, future global change scenarios. And uh, uh, if we consider different uh, climate change scenarios and different uh, dispersal scenarios. Actually, the climate change scenarios did not, did not change too much the uh, uh, proportions, but these proportions uh, changed uh, significantly across the dispersal scenarios, which suggests that in the future, probably uh, the uh, dispersal limitation may uh, significantly intensify the number of uh, threatened species and uh, building uh, uh, effective corridors for conservation uh, is uh, very uh, important uh, to better uh, conserve all the plant species. And uh, cross space, these uh, threatened species 
uh, that we have identified, uh, they also uh, appear in, in relatively different uh, places compared with the current uh, threatened species. Uh, so these three maps shows the threatened species identified by, by uh, previous authors uh, published in 2017, while these are uh, uh, those that we have identified as the threatened species under future global changes. And they are quite uh, 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 different. This also posed um, uh, great challenges for future conservation planning. We have to merge these two so that we can uh, uh, better preserve uh, threatened species in China. And then uh, speaking about conservation, um, in the uh, in the pre in previous studies, most conservation planning are based on uh, species diversity, uh, which accounts only the number of species or a few uh, 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 umbrella species. But different species actually have different uh, contain different evolutionary history. If we consider these two species, uh, which are species that are from very long branches, these species. Uh, are very evolutionary distinct. They contain probably uh, more cons uh, evolution diversity or ev evolution information compared with these two species, which are uh, from a clade that contains many closely uh, close relatives. So the extinction of the species with the uh, ev with high evolutionary uh, uh, distinctiveness will lead to high uh, biodiversity losses. Um, so if we want to better conserve plant diversity, we need to uh, consider to preserve the, the entire tree of life so that we can better preserve the entire evolutionary history. And uh, based on the plant diversity uh, in, in of woody plants in China, we uh, identified some regions as uh, near hotspot and paleo hotspot. Near hotspots contains many species that that come from the uh, clays with many uh, relative uh, close relatives. Uh, in this uh, these near hotspots actually are based on our study. We found that they are mainly located in the southeastern part of the uh, Tibetan Plateau, the Hangduan Mountains. In these areas, they have uh, many species with relative with the close relatives and they have uh, now these species contain uh, uh, or are less evolutionary distinct but in sorry but in southern yunnan uh, western guangxi and hainan in these areas um, the species actually are many of the uh, many of the plant species are, are from uh, clays and that contain very high evolutionary distinctiveness and they are uh, they are identified as a paleo hotspots. Um, if we um, if we look at the conservation status of these uh, neo hotspots and paleo hotspots, we found that um, based on uh, the current um, nature reserve network in China, the uh, neo hotspots uh, have been covered by the uh, nature reserves. Uh, very, uh, very well. Twenty percent, almost twenty percent of the near hotspots are covered by nature reserves, but the paleo hotspots are covered to only about uh, eight percent of the area. Uh, this green line shows the average average uh, area coverage at the national scale. It means that the paleo hotspot uh, is very worse uh, protected by the current uh, nature reserves compared with the near hotspot. So if we want to con conserve the tree of life in the future, paleo hotspot probably should be the priority areas for conservation. And we further evaluated uh, the, uh, the performance of the current uh, nature reserves in conserving the tree of life of plants in China. Uh, we first, um, Identify the priority areas uh, that will ideally preserve the tree of life, best preserve the tree of life, ideally. That's the um, uh, blue areas. And uh, then we overlapped the identified 
ideal areas for preserving the tree of life with the current nature reserves. We found that these two types of areas, uh, the nature reserves and the priority areas identif identified, do not overlap with each other. The over overlap is very, very little, actually. That's the, these blue, uh, bars. Um, and if we divide all the country into different categories of, uh, phylogenetic diversity, uh, from the, uh, the areas with the lowest phylogenetic diversity to the areas with the highest phylogenetic diversity, then we found that the, the coverage of these areas by the current nature reserves decreased from the lowest phylogenetic diversity to the highest. So this very continuous decrease. It means that the current nutrient reserve uh, actually did, did a very poor job in preserving the tree of life of plants in China. And, and uh, another very uh, worrying effect, a uh, worrying thing is that um, most of the nature reserves uh, in China are experiencing very extensive human uh, disturbance and also very extensive climate change. And our evaluation suggests that in the future, uh, under future global change scenarios, the species diversity and phylogenetic diversity in the nature reserves tend to significantly decrease. This suggests that global change in the future may uh, decrease the performance of our uh, current nature reserves. Uh, so in the future, we, the, the challenge is that how we could preserve the tree of life under, by, by taking into consideration of the uh, global change scenarios. So we did, um, uh, 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 analysis try to identify the, uh, the, the areas uh, that are suitable for conservation of the tree of life under future uh, global change scenarios. Uh, if we, um, if we can, uh, uh, plan the protected areas, uh, within these, uh, 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 uh ident identified priority areas, we can actually, uh, dramatically increase the conservation status of the branches, uh, of the tree of life of China. Um, from, uh, you see, if we, uh, extend the protected areas, uh, in these identified, uh, priority areas, then we can increase the average coverage of most, uh, uh branches to above 25% of the, uh, of, of its distribution area. Um, but a worrying if, uh, thing is that in the identified priority areas for, uh, for the expansion of protected areas, the human activities are much more extensive than the other areas and also much more extensive than the areas of the current protected areas. This suggests that, um, in the future ex expansion of protected areas, we are facing a very, uh, 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 high cost, uh, because in the identified, uh, priority areas, um, the economic and the human activities are very high. Uh, how we could reconcile the de development and uh, conservation of plant diversity is, uh, is, uh, a very, uh, uh, large question, uh, to be answered. And uh, we propose that probably the, uh, the, uh, OECM, the other effective area-based conservation measures could be one of the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, means to achieve this goal. Um, so I will end with these two, uh, take home messages. Um, see, based on our, our study, we found that plant distributions in many Chinese mountains have significantly changed. Uh, some of the species move upward as we expected, but many of the species also moved downward, which, uh, which, uh, is quite out of, uh, uh our expectation. And these distribution changes may lead to, uh, very large, uh, mismatches between, uh, uh, the interactions between plants and, uh, and uh, animals and also may lead to changes in plant communities. 
And also, we found that future climate and land use changes will, uh, will significantly reduce the performance of the current protected areas. And uh, uh, a, a future challenge in conservation practice in China is to reconcile the, uh, the development and the conservation, especially by taking into consideration of future global change scenarios. Um, so with that, I would like to thank uh, the group that, uh, uh, my group that have conducted many of the studies. And also, I'd like, I would like to thank the uh, funding agencies that have su support my research. And uh, uh, I will I will thank you for all uh, for your attention, and thank you, Professor Zhang, for uh, providing this good opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Zhang, for your excellent presentations, and uh, uh, you give us uh, some very new uh, findings about how plant diversity uh, respond to the climate change. And uh, yeah, it's quite a su surprising for me to see some plants move uh, upward and some plants move downward uh, under the climate change. So this will provide some very novel insight in the future conservations of the uh, species. And uh, I also quite uh, 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 echo with you about the importance of uh, climate change and the global change uh, into the conservation priorities in the future. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, presentation. We'll have a discussion later. Thank you. Now we'll uh, continue our presentations. Uh, we welcome Professor Du Wei Guo, a professor from the Institute of Zoology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. And the Professor Du uh, is a, a very famous scientist in the um, uh, uh, field of uh, reptile studies, uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, focus on the climate change impact on the uh, indoor physiology. So, uh, welcome, Professor Du. Okay, morning, everybody. Uh, I I would like to thank the the organizer of this symposium, Professor Zbin Zhang, for inviting me. Uh, it's it's my great pleasure to attend this uh, symposium and uh, listening interesting talks on climate change effects. Uh, on diversity of species. Uh, so what I'm going to talk today is predicting the vulnerability of reptiles to climate change, the importance of uh, embryo, embryo physiology. Okay, climate change is a big threat to biodiversity. According to IPCC's reports, Global surface temperature have increased by 0 0.8 degrees Celsius since 1900 and will continue to increase in future due to the increased emission of greenhouse gas. It's project that over 80% of land and water system will be exposed to unfavorable climate condition in 2070. As you all know, human activity has led to tremendous changes in environment, including climate warming. Climate warming has pervasive impacts on almost all aspects of, of organisms' biology, uh, including genetic structures, physiology, behavior, population dynamic, species interaction, and community diversity, and eventually ecosystem service. How to predict the vulnerability of organisms to climate warming is a hot topic in ecology, which has important uh, implication for conservation efforts. Many research have conducted comparative studies, manipulation experiments, or ecological modeling to understand the impact of climate warming on organisms and therefore predict their vulnerability. For example, some species shift their distribution range upwards or polarwards to check pseudo thermal habitats. Ecological modeling predicts that extinction risk of species will continuously increase with future global temperature. 
However, traditional studies evaluating the impact of climate warming mainly focus on post-embryonic stages with much less attention on embryos. This is largely because we know little about how embryos respond to temperature variation and therefore climate warming. In fact, post-embryonic individuals made an important subject for traditional studies of thermal biology. Those studies have identified behavioral, physiological, and biochemical adaptation of alpha adults in response to temperature change. It's expected that embryos may use a similar mechanism to cope with temperature change, but such study on embryos are very limited. Given that embryos are sensitive and vulnerable to temperature, understanding the response of embryos to temperature is critical for predicting the impact of carbon warming on organisms. Today, I would like to talk two case studies to explain how we can predict the vulnerability of animals to climate warming based on the behavior and the physiological traits of embryos. First, let's have a look at the behavior similarization by turtle embryos, which can affect offspring sex ratio in species with temperature dependent sex determination. Behaviors Similar regression is the main mode of similar regression in exosomes. The exosomes can adjust their body temperatures to a suitable level by basking or shuddering. There are two essential conditions for behavior similar regressions. The first one is thermal gradient, which are common in the environment from small tree leaves to large mountains. Second, animals are capable of moving around to find them suitable thermal environments. Behavior similar regression may play an important role in buffering the impact of climate warming. A poor thermal regulator has little capacity for buffering the impact of climate warming behavior, whereas an ineffective thermal regulator may be able to mitigate the climate warming effects and buy time for species to adapt genetically later. Reptiles are exposed to thermal gradients and have the capacity of free movement. So, behavior similar regression is uh, very common in post embryonic stages. However, embryos are trapped within an immobile egg in which has been traditionally assumed to have no thermal gradients. In addition, embryos lack of mobility, therefore, behavior similar regression was thought unlikely in reptile embryos. In contrast to this assumption, however, we detect a significant thermal gradients inside egg of Chinese pond turtle in field nets. The average temperature difference between the two ends of an egg is about 1 to 2 degrees Celsius. Moreover, our experiment on the Chinese soft-shell turtle showed that turtle embryos move within the egg to find optimal temperatures, which is similar to the basking behavior in adult reptiles. When the heat source at the left side of the embryos, the embryo moves close to the heat source. When we change the location of the heat source to the right, the embryos followed. The other pictures show the typical position of an ambulance from the control, and the low picture shows the typical position of an ambulance from the side heating treatment. The ambulance moved to the retro position. This finding not only falsifies the traditional assumption that ambulance are somewhat passive, but also raised more questions. One of the interesting questions is what is the adapt adaptive significance of embryonic behavior similar regression? We all know the sex of most of turtles depend on development temperature rather than sex determined genes. The Chinese pond turtle is not an exception, with male offspring produced at low temperatures and female at high temperatures. Moreover, 
During the temperature sensitive period of X16 elimination, our primary studies demonstrated that the embryos are small and highly active, and thus have enough room to move around to find a suitable thermal environment inside the egg. Accordingly, we hypothesized that the embryos of turtle might be able to influence their own sex by behavior thermal regulation. However, we faced a uh, a technical obstacle to test this hypothesis uh, how to manipulate behavior simulation of embryos. We learned from literature that some thermal active trap channel help animals to detect temperature changes, and the capsizipine is an inhibitor of trap channel. Previous studies have demonstrated that the crocodiles treated with capsizipine decreased behavior simulation significantly, so we use capsizipine to inhibit the behavior similar regression by embryos. We first carried our experiment in the laboratory. We incubated turtle eggs at three different thermal treatment, constant and fluctuating temperature, and a lateral heating treatment. In each treatment, we had a control group and uh, capsizipine treatment, which inhibit behavior similar regression of embryos. Then we measured the incubation period of eggs and the body size and the sex of the offspring. In this experiment design, the constant and the fluctuating temperature enable us to detect the uh, effect of the capsizipine itself because embryos were not exposed to a thermal gradient. The lateral heating treatment enables us to detect the effect of behavior similar regression because we manipulated the thermal regression behavior of uh, embryos. Then we evaluate the effect of the behavior similar regression by turtle embryo in nest, because finding a turtle nest in natural habitat is extremely hard due to field population crops in China. We construct a nesting habitat for turtles at a turtle farm. We plant trees, shrubs, grass on the bank of a pond to mimic natural breeding habitat where female turtles build their nest from May to dry in each year. We conduct experiments in semi natural nests from 2016 to 2018. We used a split clutch design to land them assign eggs with each clutch to the uh, capsizipine versus control groups to avoid any influence of clutch origin. Eggs in nest were treated with capsizipine or with an equivalent value of solution without capsizipine as a control. Nest temperature were monitored with temperature data loggers. After eggs had developed for more than two thirds of the incubation period, covering the thermal sensitive period of X16 meshing, we retrieved the eggs and brought them back to the laboratory. Let's see the results. First, from the constant and fluctuating temperature experiment, we knew that capsizipine did not affect incubation period and offspring traits, including sex ratio. So capsizipine itself did not uh, affect our experimental results. Then both the laboratory and the semen nature experiment demonstrated that capsizipine did inhibit behavior simulation by turtle embryos because embryos treated with capsizipine moved much less than the control. The most interesting result is that embryonic behavior similar regression influences sex determination. In the lab laboratory experiment, we found the embryos treated with capsizipine experienced low temperature and produced male hatchlings, the red bar, while the embryos from the control group may be able to find a warmer temperature and produce relatively equal numbers of male and female offspring, the blue bar. In similar nature experiment, all eggs hatched as males under the cold condition in May to, uh, to, to, uh, 2018, and all females under extremely hot condition in June 2017. However, in the mouse with intermediate temperatures, the sex ratio was closely related to the nest temperature for embryos without some regression, the red bars, but relatively balanced for embryos with, with some regression, the blue bar. 
to predict offspring sex ratio on climate change, we developed develop models incorporated in embryonic behavior similar regression. We use the microclimate model to calculate the soil temperature at uh, 10 centimeters beneath the soil surface as nest temperature. Then we used the results from this study to estimate the relationship between offspring sex ratio and the nest temperature. Our model uh, predicted that global warming will skew, will skew the sex ratio of the species to female, precede the middle column or area turn to red, means all females. However, the sex ratio shift induced by global warming will be buffered by the ability of embryos to influence their sex, sex by behavior similar regression. Uh, the right panel, uh, in this panel, the, the light green means less change in sex ratio. So, therefore, our study implied that although global warming written the viability of many tiered species by inducing sex ratio bias, the bias may be mitigated partly by embryonic similar regression in addition to other mechanisms like uh, maternal nesting behavior and the maternal hormone investment in eggs. Now let's move on to the next story. Embryonic thermal tolerance shaped the vulnerability of lizards to climate change. Embryos often have relatively low thermal tolerance and are more vulnerable to heat stress than adults. Accordingly, understanding embryonic up thermal tolerance is essential for predicting the climate change vulnerability of species with complex life cycles. A previous study determined the EUTT by monitoring the temperatures at which uh, heart rate stops. This study indicated that EUTT is important for projecting the vulnerability of species to climate warming. Nonetheless, we still know little about how geographic variation of embryonic heat tolerance and its development plasticity out to the projection of species distribution. We use this diagram to explain the question and the hypothesis in our study. The blue line represents EUTT. The red line represents soil temperature, which increases on the climate warming. Once soil temperature is high, then EUTT embryos would be exposed to heat stress. The first question is how EUTT vary geographically. We hypothesize that Embryos from high latitude, which occupy variable thermal environments, would have EUTT, high EUTT than those from a low latitude, as shown in figure B. The second is how EUTT respond to developmental temperatures. We hypothesized that EUTT at a different latitude could respond to developmental temperature in one of the following uh, four thermal reaction norm: constant, increase. Uh, decreasing or bell shape in the light of the plasticity of the up thermal tolerance documented in adults. We use the North Cross lizards, Tectoramus subnationalis, as a study system. This species is widely distributed across eastern China. We select three populations across uh, latitude from subtropical to temperate regions, which represent high, medium, and low latitude population spectrally. We measured the nest temperature at these three localities and found that the nest temperature increased as latitude decreased. The first step to collect uh, lizards from the field. It's not an easy job to get enough some size of lizards, but for joy. For example, our car was often bugged by murder in the field. But we did learn from local people how to catch lizards carefully and find a lizard nest. We brought the lizards back to our laboratory where the lizards lay eggs. We incubated the eggs at different temperatures and measured the EUTT of embryos. We found that, as we expect, the high latitude population had high EUTT than the medium and the low latitude populations. In addition, the EUTT did not vary among incubation temperature in the high-latitude population, indicate a constant reaction norm. 
the EUTT increased with development temperature first, but decreased later in the medium latitude population, uh, showing a bell shaped reaction norm. The EUTT decreased with an increased incubation temperature for the low latitude population, showing a decreasing reaction norm. The frequencies of histories experienced by angels were significantly increased from present to the future when considering geographic variation of EUTT. Low latitude population with, with a low AUTT would experience high frequency of history than medium and high latitude population. In addition, the history frequency was higher under the decreasing reaction norm and the lowest under the positive reaction norm. So our study reviews geographic variation in mean and develop, developmental uh, plasticity of EUTT and highlights its importance for predicting species vulnerability and the range shift in response to climate change. In the future, more physiological traits of embryos should be uh, incorporated into the integrated models to provide a more accurate prediction of species vulnerability to climate change. Okay, that's what I talked today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my students and collaborators. Their work provided data that I can showcase here. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Du, and the very interesting talk. Uh, you show us uh, how climate change affect animals at the embryo levels. So it's a very interesting uh, story, and uh, yeah, climate will have very uh, significant impact on the lizards and uh, some uh, amphibians. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think it's the last presentation uh, by myself. I will uh, uh, move my presentation quickly. I should uh, upload the screen. Okay, can you hear the slide? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure. I, I will uh, show uh, briefly about uh, our recent uh, studies on how climate change affects uh, the population dynamics uh, of uh, animals. I will select some uh, case studies because of time limited. So my presentation will uh, include several parts. First, I'll give a very brief introduction. Yes, and uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, the global change includes the human uh, activities. Uh, the, now the Earth has uh, over 50, uh, about 50% 50 of the land has been uh, used by humans. So. This is a great impact uh, on uh, animal population. So the red color shows the arrows uh, uh, used by humans for culture or for industry or for root. So uh, this is really a, a impact, a great impact on uh, our ecosystem. Second, uh, people may uh, global war uh, uh, global warming. So it's a Another imp uh, imp imp important factor of the global warming, uh, global change. Uh, as a uh, uh, previous uh, present uh, speaker has mentioned that during past uh, but, uh, uh, over hundred years, uh, the air temperature has increased about uh, one degree. So this will uh, have a profound uh, impact on our climate, uh, temperature, precipitation, and then plants and animals. Another uh, broader cl uh, climate is El Nino, La Nino effect. Uh, now people realize that they are very important in uh, changing the globally uh, temperature, precipitation, and often bring uh, some biological disasters. So uh, it is a very significant uh, short-term uh, 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 climate uh, signals to affect the population of animals, maybe also plants. Another one is uh, uh, North Atlantic oscillations. Uh, it is a uh, 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 important uh, uh, short-term uh, climate signals 
mainly affect the North uh, 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 North America uh, and uh, the Europe uh, and the Western Europe uh, because uh, they uh, are changing the directions. Uh, in the positive phase, they will more uh, uh, in winter more uh, more snows cool uh, in in the northeast America, but in the negative phase, uh, they will bring most snow in the in the middle on uh, regions and the south part of Europe. So uh, these are uh, importantly uh, short term uh, uh, climate signals. So I'll give you some examples on how uh, uh, in ENSO and NAO uh, affect the population variations. I'll give you two examples. One uh, is we studied in many years ago with collaboration with uh, Neil, Charlie and uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, we are linking the, the climate change to the population cycles of hair and Linux. Uh, as uh, uh, Charlie has shown you his uh, uh, field observations about the uh, dynamic of the snow hair. And uh, I, uh, in this paper, we uh, uh, focus on analysis of the historical uh, records of the snow uh, hair and uh, uh, Linux. Um, uh, it is a famous uh, 9 to 11 uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, oscillations, periodically uh, uh, oscillations, 9 to 11 years, but it varies uh, uh, different years. So we collect the information uh, mostly based on the fur data uh, from the companies, and we uh, incorporate the uh, broader scale uh, climate index like uh, ENSO, and NAO and also the North uh, Hemisphere temperature into the models to see how they affect the, uh, the, the dynamics and the cyclings. We have some very interesting uh, uh, findings that if we uh, don't uh, include the uh, ENSO, NAO and the temperature, uh, the, the oscillation between them cannot be sustained uh, as shown uh, in the red part of the uh, uh, the uh, figures. If we include uh, this uh, uh, broader uh, climate index, we have very good simulations about the uh, uh, oscillations, the periodic oscillations of hair and the Linux. So uh, we uh, we suggest NAO and ENSO is essential in driving the hair Linux cycles. And furthermore, we found. Uh, uh, temperature has very interesting uh, uh, impact on the on the Linux uh, because uh, temperature has been shown have some positive effect on the Linux uh, through uh, effect of the snow and uh, the the hair. But uh, in the in the in the longer period, we will see, for example, for the dashed line with the temperature increase. Uh, how they will affect, uh, they will decrease the abundance of the uh, uh, Linux abundance. Uh, we have two observations. For example, during before 1950s, you say with the increase of the temperature, uh, the oscillation amplitude decreased, but the uh, oscillation still uh, is there. Uh, after 1975, we see a uh, continually uh, rapidly uh, climate warmings uh, in the Canadian regions, and you see the oscillation uh, decreased uh, rapidly. Uh, rapidly. So uh, we'll say uh, temperature has both positively and a negative effect on Linux, uh, as shown in the uh, in the small figure of the red. Uh, the negative effect is uh, climate warming will uh, increase uh, precipitation in summer. And uh, reduce the snow cover in the in the winter, so this may affect uh, uh, the higher survivals and uh, then uh, Linux populations. Uh, another study is a recently study, also collaboration with Maso and uh, uh, Charlie Rodolf and uh, Niels. So we are uh, uh, because uh, 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 there are quite a lot of studies on the association between. Uh, and so uh, NAO and population dynamics, but we are not sure how uh, uh, animals from different regions respond uh, uh, to uh, ENSO and NAO. So this figure shows uh, 
uh, the uh, meta uh, uh, meta uh, meta uh, data analysis. We searched uh, over four thousand literatures, and then finally, we uh, used uh, about uh, five hundred literatures, uh, covering about uh, six hundred species, uh, because we want to draw more con conservative conclusions. We only use data over 20 years long and with a, a quantitative analysis. So uh, this figure show uh, uh, the impact of the ENSO uh, for the red. Uh, you will see uh, ENSO have very broad impact on the population dynamics of many uh, species, mammals, birds, and insects, reptiles, and amphibians. And uh, uh, the novel finding is that the ENSO impacts not only restricted uh, uh, in the uh, tropical regions, but uh, they have very broad impact on the uh, Pacific regions, Pacific regions uh, like uh, the, uh, the America, uh, America. And uh, yes, you as you uh, see, can see the impact of ENSO on Australia is very, very obviously. So now ENSO uh, has been a very significant signal uh, based on studies by Chris Dickman. Uh, can be used uh, very significant signals for wildlife management <coughs> and welfare uh, preventions and uh, early warnings. Uh, another interesting finding is that ENSO's impact, NAO's impact, mostly restricted to uh, Europe, uh, Western Europe, and the uh, North America. So uh, it's quite consistent with the predictions of the uh, climate uh, uh, experts. So. Uh, this is a, a study uh, uh, indicating very broad impact. Now, based on uh, uh, this is my, my data analysis, now we uh, expanded uh, the uh, population ecology uh, series. Uh, as you know, climate uh, theory is a very important part uh, of the population ecology theory. Uh, but uh, uh, the broader scale uh, firstly proposed by uh, Elton in 1924, uh, but uh, largely uh, ignored, ignored. So only uh, during the past two decades, uh, we now have more evidence that uh, the broader scale climate, like the ENSO, NAO, can affect animals through the uh, atmosphere circulations and ocean current. So uh, this gives some uh, uh, future uh, studies for, for the for the future priorities like the bottom up chain effect, uh, ecological uh, uh, buffers. That means uh, some animals may uh, <coughs> may not synchronize together. This is maybe caused by intra specific or inter specific uh, uh, competitions uh, or predictions. So need more uh, investigations. And uh, we also find about a uh, uh, ten. 10 or 20 percent uh, species uh, has a non-monotonic effect. That means uh, the ENSO or NO has both a positive or negative effect depending on the regions of the time delay of the environment. So um, based on these studies, we strongly suggest uh, ENSO and NAO can be used uh, as uh, early warning signals for wildlife man management, for example, for pest control or for the uh, wildlife conservations and, uh, and uh, the uh, animal harvest management. Um, then I will uh, give you some impact uh, presentations about the impact of uh, uh, temperature and human activity on the local extinctions. Uh, I'll give you uh, one example uh, we published in PS. We uh, uh, digitalized the history records uh, over the past 3,000 years in China. You know, China has a very good history for recording very important events, including uh, uh, some animals like uh, the panda, or rhinos, or elephant. So that information can uh, even very coarse and rough, but you will have a large amount of uh, data, so can be uh, give you some information. So we use the, the last observations and uh, as a uh, uh, the disappearing or local extinction uh, uh, standard uh, criteria. Then we make a comparisons uh, 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 be, uh, uh, before the past uh, uh, 50 years or 100 years to see how uh, uh, environmental change uh, affects the uh, 
uh, last observations, uh, we call, we define the local uh, uh, extinction. So uh, this figure show you uh, during past three thousand years, uh, you will see uh, how uh, the proportion a uh, number of the we call the uh, proportion of the, uh, uh, the spatial grids. Uh, that's a, a we call the population range size. So uh, they show the uh, uh, continually uh, uh, contractions, particularly after the Qing dynasties, uh, because the population increase uh, uh, very likely, and also uh, maybe uh, uh, climate change uh, may affect this. So we developed a methodology to uh, separate, to split uh, the, the impact of the human and the climate change. Uh, so this is the data show you uh, 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 on the left uh, uh, figures show you with the uh, increase of human population density. So uh, the local extinction probabilities uh, would increase uh, uh, like a power functions for many larger man man uh, we, we use a 12 uh, mammals. Uh, this is quite a consistent before uh, industry and after industry uh, uh, period. And the, the, the bottom two small figures show uh, some animals show the uh, with the temperature increase, so they will increase uh, their uh, local extinctions. But some animals also species show uh, climate cooling also uh, will uh, uh, increase their local uh, extinction probability. Uh, uh, our explanation is that before, uh, before um, uh, industry uh, time, uh, temperature is cooling uh, gradually. Only after the industry, climate uh, become warming quickly. So uh, because during this pair, uh, the, the habitat is very fragmented. So uh, weather cooling, uh, weather warming, climate warming, both can uh, uh, cause the uh, local extinction because it cannot move across uh, the fragmented habitat. So this uh, from this paper, we provide uh, 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 suggestions to build uh, the corridors along the uh, latitude or altitude to uh, uh, facilitate uh, animal uh, movement to reduce uh, local extinctions. Uh, finally, I uh, will introduce how uh, temperature and human activities arrange the uh, range shift. Um, so uh, another example is uh, about the Yunnan elephant. Uh, so it is a uh, focus recently because uh, we uh, have observed the uh, north uh, world movement uh, recently. So Professor uh, Wei Fuwen uh, uh, suggests that we uh, conduct a modeling analysis to see how human activities and uh, uh, climate affect the uh, population expansions of the elephant because there are many uh, theories about uh, the expansion. Some people suggest uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe habitat change, maybe population uh, uh, create, uh, increase because of better protections, or some people suggest maybe drought uh, issues. So uh, we uh, conduct a model analysis. We uh, uh, dig uh, digitalize the literature data uh, during past 50 years, uh, this figure shows uh, uh, we have the uh, the left one is the first ob the first ob 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 observation uh, time and the places and the site. So the green color shows it was originally observed. So the first observation can give you the population expansions. So. Uh, quite a similar uh, methodologies to the, our study in PNS, but the PNS shows the last observation to see the local extinctions. And the uh, first observation can help you to understand the uh, population expansions. So similarly, we uh, add, uh, for each grid, uh, we, we divided the whole regions into uh, uh, grids, and uh, for each grid, we will have a First, about visit time, and then uh, uh, we select another uh, time uh, past uh, uh, five years and uh, ten years of the same grade. So we make the difference. What's the difference of the climate uh, environment, human activities between 
it's first observation and uh, uh, five years ago or 10 years ago, then to see what the uh, factors are uh, driving uh, their expansion. So uh, the figure A shows the, uh, the, the, really the population uh, uh, expansions. So from 1960s to, uh, to now, uh, so the elephant, uh, uh, the range uh, expand quickly. Uh, the B figure shows the temperature also show a steadily increase. Uh, but the precipitation, no uh, increase in trend, but uh, flunked greatly. And uh, the figure D shows the uh, increase of the population density. So uh, we needed to figure out uh, whether particularly difficult uh, to uh, split the effect of the temperature and the human because they have both the increasing uh, trend. So this figure show you uh, very clearly uh, uh, figure C uh, show you before 1990s. So their range is very limited in the Yunnan province, right? And after 1990s, uh, you will see their population expand in both directions, but uh, more uh, obviously is to the north. Uh, uh, now is to the Kunming uh, suburb. So uh, it's uh, about uh, 400 kilograms. Uh, yeah, quite a Quite, quite uh, far away, so <laughs> it's fascinating. Uh, uh, it become uh, the, v, uh, the TV news uh, worldwide. So people are very concerned about the conservation. So, and the temperature and uh, also show the differences. Uh, 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 the the average the average elevation uh, average latitude of the distribution also increased. So it have uh, obviously a uh, north world movement. So we, uh, with this picture show you the, how the, the environment, the climate change. So figure, uh, figure A, uh, show you, uh, the temperature. So you will see on the, on the last part of the, uh, Yunnan is a, is a, is a distrib distributed regions. There are uh, temperature. There is a more increase, more, uh, increased, uh, temperature. But for the precipitation, as shown in the figure B, and uh, uh, in the middle, uh, they experienced more drought, but on the uh, both north and south, uh, some increase of the precipitations. And uh, the figure C show you the uh, population density. So uh, you will see uh, along the uh, highway road, uh, there are some uh, settlement there, uh, obviously uh, increase of the population because of expansions of the cities. Uh, other towns. Uh, so uh, the D show you the, the IUCN uh, because the elephant is widely uh, distributed in the India uh, South Asian country. So uh, with this information, we construct a model. So uh, this model, we have a five year uh, time window and a 10 years time window. That means we make a comparison, the differences of the environment and the climate between five years, uh, 10 years ago to say the effect. So figure A show you with the temperature, uh, with the increase of the population densities, uh, the probability of the first of opposition increase. So, uh, this is very different from the traditional views because, uh, uh, traditionally we believe, uh, human density will decrease uh, populations, but now you will see more, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the elephants. This is obviously because people now take more attention, protection, uh, elephants. So uh, now elephants, uh, don't have free, uh, people, uh, the settlement area. So they, uh, uh, they like to go to the farmland, go to the settlement, uh, look for water uh, and uh, for the food. So that's uh, the explanation why uh, uh, in the areas with high densities increase will have more uh, increase of the elephant. Uh, 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 the uh, figure B shows the temperature has a uh, positively. That means warming really increase there. Uh, first observations and because the warming more important than in the north. So this may be a driving force for the drought, uh, for the precipitation, uh, in a five year time window, we see a negative effect. That's mean drought is not good for them. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yes, drought is good for them. Maybe 
uh, drive them for for the looking uh, looking for food at Hungary. Uh, DEF show uh, the uh, ten years time window uh, uh, for the human uh, densities. Uh, 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 in the old, in the earlier years, we we really see uh, more people were not good for the elephant uh, uh, appearance. But uh, in the later, you, you can see uh, they also have a positively association with uh, population density. Temperature has a very more strong effect uh, for the uh, first observation probabilities. And uh, uh, for the for the precipitation, as a 10 years time scale, the effect is opposite to the five year time window. So more rain uh, is better for the uh, uh, appearance of the elephant. So it's a uh, scale dependent. Uh, then uh, we uh, uh, simulate during, uh, we have a predictions about the next 10 years, uh, how elephant will move. So we predict uh, uh, elephant will continue to move uh, to the uh, northeast. Uh, and uh, this direction is just uh, the direction of retreat during past uh, uh, 2000 years because the time Climate, uh, climate cooling during past uh, thousand years. So, uh, elephant appeared in the Yellow River regions, very north in China. So, uh, because uh, time climate cooling, so they retreated to the Yunnan uh, regions and uh, uh, Reno just become uh, extinct. So, with warming, it is more likely they will move no northward. So, it's necessary to build corridors cause a climate uh, adaptation uh, corridors to facilitate their movement and also uh, increase their protections. Uh, another example is about uh, the contractions of uh, 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 small rodents in the uh, Inner Mongolia rest, uh, grassland. Uh, because elephant is a tropical, subtropical animal, so uh, they have different responses. Uh, for the for the for the small uh, animals, uh, brown devil, they are distributed in the Inner Mongolia highland uh, grassland. So we find uh, the population extraction contractions uh, in its uh, uh, south boundaries uh, because uh, I, I remember in 1970s or 80s. So we have a lot of research stations in the south part of the uh, Inner Mongolia. But now it's very hard to find them. So uh, we find them mostly in the boundary uh, areas with Mongolia. So uh, we uh, speculated uh, maybe uh, climate warming uh, caused the contractions of the south boundaries, but uh, 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 no cognitive analysis. Of course, uh, human activities may uh, also uh, attribute it. So we have similarly uh, modelings, but now we use the last observations. Uh, so we define the last observations plus uh, our uh, further uh, field uh, field observations uh, uh, during the last uh, few years. To uh, if no uh, animals were found, we define them disappear. So we are not sure the weather locally extinct. So more conservatively, we see that. Uh, uh, disappear. So for each grid, you will have the last observation time and the site. And then we make a, pre uh, a comparison between the 10 years, uh, uh, what's the uh, uh, temperature of precipitation, vegetation, and human activity 10 years ago, and why they dis uh, be disappeared. So we uh, use this model, so we, 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 we make a assessment. As uh, you see uh, in the figure A, so the population size uh, really uh, see a uh, contraction uh, uh, during past decades. And the temperature in Inner Mongolia high, very good increase, you know, uh, similar to Charlie's in the north of China, uh, the temperature increase much uh, faster uh, than in the south. Uh, but the precipitation, no trend. Uh, people, population uh, increase also have a trend. So uh, we uh, uh, construct uh, models uh, with uh, interaction effect, uh, without interaction effect. So we have a very consistent uh, observation on the uh, positive association between uh, disappearance probability 
of brown wool and the temperature increase. So uh, we uh, uh, have the uh, uh, predictions. Also, uh, uh, using the models, uh, we, we will see how they will uh, contract it. So uh, during uh, past decades, you will see uh, the boundary extracted at nearly 287 kilometers. So uh, uh, much faster because uh, uh, for for the other animals about 10 years uh, 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 20 kilograms uh, because the temperature increase much faster in the in the Mongolia so uh, that's why we observed the much uh, uh, faster contraction uh, is uh, sus boundaries we also analyzed the uh, association between uh, their uh, uh, the this we, we define uh this period rings maximum temperature threshold in summer it was a 27 uh, f uh, upon five degree that's mean uh, uh when temperature uh, reaches 27 uh the uh, the this uh, appearability very high uh, very high and very interesting that this is uh, temperature is very close to its uh, lower critical temperature uh, we call the thermal neutral zone of the species, uh, exactly 27.5 degrees. Uh, as you know, the thermal uh, neutral zone is very uh, key for defining the distribution of the animal. So uh, uh, this uh, may be another evidence that uh, climate warming will cause uh, uh, contractions of this species. So, uh, give some uh, take home messages. First, in the short term period, and so NAO uh, are shown to play a very key role in driving population dynamics of animals uh, for, uh, in the larger geographic areas. Uh, thus, uh, they can be used as early warning signals for wildlife conservation, pest or disease control. Uh, at the multiple annual uh, levels. This is uh, our uh, conclusions. Uh, uh, second uh, is uh, uh, both climate warming and clim uh, human activities uh, uh, contributed to the local extinction or uh, uh, all, uh, uh, disappearance, uh, range of contraction or expansion. Uh, I would say this uh, largely depend on uh, the animals' locations. If animals are tropical animals, so climate warming is good for them for expansions. But uh, for the animals in the middle uh, latitude or uh, in the Arctic regions, so they will face uh, uh, the south boundary contractions. Uh, if uh, uh, if the climate warming grows too fast, so. Uh, or too high, uh, they may uh, disappear, you know, totally, uh, because there has no place to move. Uh, this is also true for the uh, for the for the animals in the in the high mountains. So uh, the, the 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 bottom figure show uh, you that the human activities, uh, because of habitat destructions, will block their movement normally under the climate change. Uh, for example, in the no in the tropical regions. Uh, uh, because of habitat uh, destruct, uh, destruction, so uh, they cannot expand expand their uh, populations. Uh, like the uh, uh, elephant, uh, they, they want to expand, but the habitat lost. So they have heavily depend on the, the human dominant landscape. So they will cause some damages to their farmland uh, and the houses of the local people. So now, fortunately, uh, the Chinese government gave the ecological compensations. Uh, so that's uh, 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 that's give a very good solution to solve the conflict of the humans and the wildlife and the climate change. Thus, uh, in the in the in the uh, uh, sorry in the uh, in the middle latitude regions, uh, uh, so the, uh, similarly, so uh, maybe you cannot see uh, the. Uh, you can see uh, both uh, contraction in, in, in the south boundary and expansion in the uh, north uh, boundary. Uh, for the animals living in the uh, temperate regions or Arctic regions, you will see their uh, contraction of the south boundary, like the brown walls we studied. So uh, climate uh, have different 
impact on different animals. Uh, thus, we suggest and the uh, ongoing global uh, accelerated global chain, uh, the ecological corridors for adaptation, uh, for climate adaptation along the altitude, elevation, uh, very important, uh, very necessary. Because uh, uh, the, 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 the natural reserve is not big enough. So uh, like uh, uh, Zhihong said, uh, so uh, the, the currently uh, uh, conservation effective needs are reducing, uh, re reducing its effectiveness because of climate change. So it's necessary to expand. Uh, similarly for pests and diseases, uh, the time I cannot show our studies. Uh, climate warming will increase the tropical diseases. So uh, we now seeing uh, some species like the, uh, we call the Asia rat, and originally in the south, now expanded to the north. And some uh, dengue diseases is expanding in China. So Okay, uh, future study, I would suggest the long-term monitoring is very important to understanding uh, impact of climate change. As uh, Charlie Krebs has uh, shown us uh, 50 year studies, uh, Chris show us many, many year studies uh, and, uh, and the muscle. So only long-term monitoring uh, is very important. This need uh, really sustainable support from the government. And uh, uh, historic data extractions analysis are also useful to quantify the effect of uh, global change, particularly the population contraction or uh, expansions. Uh, the, fourth, the third is a non-monotic impact uh, climate change. We need more attention. That means uh, uh, they are not uh, linearly impacted. So the climate impact can be complex, can be positive or negative, Largely depend on the scales you studied, uh, the, uh, the, the, the regions and the environment. So the role uh, of the disposal uh, corridors should be further investigated in uh, mitigating the impact of the climate change. Okay, thank you for your attention and uh, finish the my presentations. And uh, uh, sorry, I cannot control the, the time very, very well. It's now about uh, 12 o'clock. We can have uh, uh, some uh, time for discussions. And uh, because we uh, invited uh, some uh, 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 guests to attend uh, our uh, symposium, uh, I, I, I will uh, say, uh, welcome the comments, uh, whether they are available, because the time is quite a, a, a largely uh, lag hand. Uh, Professor Chiao Kexia, I'm not sure whether you are uh, available. You ha had comments on this uh, topic? Okay, maybe, yeah, she's, uh, uh, he, she's uh, now our new uh, director of the Institute. And, uh, uh, sorry, can you hear me now? You cannot hear me? Oh. Yes, I can hear you, but I guess you can't hear me. Huh? Okay, uh, what's the problem? We, we, I can hear you, Charlie. We, we can, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, oh, sorry. You know, we're organizing a symposium. It gives me a really broad view of what you, you as scientists in China in particular have been up to in, in the last uh, many years. So, um, I guess um, the thing, I guess the question that I worry about the most is uh, how to put these recommendations of yours into political action. Uh, and I know that's not the topic we can uh, really uh, address here because it's not our job to be politicians. But I think, um, and I think all we can do is, is what you already have been doing is is um, uh, making these uh, things public about what's going on in the world, and um, you know what could we could do this to uh, solve it. And I think the elephant situation was a good example. Now, um, you, you know, and I, I guess I worry greatly about uh, long-term monitoring. You know, it's uh, 
<laughs> As it was said long ago, it's like uh, the deck chairs on the Titanic, you know. <laughs> we're, we're just kind of uh, uh, mapping them out very well. But I don't know what else we can do since we don't control all the major things of climate change in particular. So, but it does come back to um, a lot of action that we need to alert the world to, and I think the IPCC has done a lot of the uh, and the details which uh, these various talks have brought forth, I think, are excellent examples. And, and I think, again, getting those out to the public um, is... Uh, is a really important thing, and it's not easy to do, and it's not my, my strong point, I guess. And if I listen to the radio here um, or the TV, as you would in China probably, you hear nothing except about this soccer game in Qatar, and I think, oh my lord, it's nice, nice entertainment, but uh, it's uh, kind of we need to bring, I think, the real problems of the world more to the fore. So that's probably my tirade. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a, a very important suggestion. So uh, maybe we will organize another uh, uh, symposium uh, for, uh, into the European and uh, Africa scientists because uh, the, the online meeting is very hard for them. Then we have a synthesis. Uh, how about the uh, our views about the impact of the uh, climate change and the human activities on, uh, on the animals and the plants. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, uh, I, uh, PCC already re released uh, their com uh, comments, but uh, uh, we can uh, have uh, our discussions and the views uh, uh, based on the long-term studies. And uh, it seems that the climate and it has a very complex impact on different species and in different regions. So uh, if we have more uh, 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 detailed, concrete information, that be very important for, for, the, for the conservation pest management. Uh, I fully agree with you. For example, uh, what's the, what's the uh, benefit uh, of the climate warming to animals or, 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 or the losses to the biodiversity? And uh, uh, how uh, uh, we act, uh, we we modified, uh, uh, how we respond to to the climate change to pre preserve better the, the the biodiversity and prevent the diseases uh, uh, transmission. So I fully agree. Uh, we should uh, take into account about the uh, large scale or broad scale climate change. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, conservation and uh, uh, wildlife management. Thank you. Well, I, I think, Jivin, it's an excellent idea to, uh, if possible, to expand this, to bring Europe and Africa in particular uh, mm -hmm. into this discussion. Lots of data there, lots of thoughts mm -hmm. that uh, don't always get across to uh, uh, us in uh, North America, certainly. So I think if a, a, a meeting, so to speak, of the minds can be organized around that part of the world, that would be a great, great suggestion. Okay, thank you, thank you. And also we plan to publish the uh, special issue for, for this symposium. So uh, you are welcome to contribute your uh, comments, or your discuss, uh, all your presentations to, to our journal. We have a, a special issue, I think. Uh, for for the for the symposium, and then we made a uh, synthesis uh, a paper based on our studies, the views of the scientists of the of, of our pro program. So I I think this is my suggestion. I hope you uh, can make some contributions to the to the papers, uh, special issues. Mm -hmm. Good good idea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any more comments, Chris? <laughs> Suggestions? For the, for the next year. Yes, yeah, so excellent discussion so far and uh, agree with the, all the comments, all the points that have been made. I think we really do need to focus on the long-term monitoring of um, species and of the systems that they occur in. One of the things that, um, that worries me a bit is that um, 
in some discussions about climate change, we often model single species as one at a time. And we hope that um, species may be able to move following their, their climatic envelope. But what we often don't think so much about is the ecological interactions they bring with them. So there's been a, a bit of discussion in, in Australia, certainly, about um, ecosystem collapse with um, not just the key species, but many other species disappearing under the extremes of climate change. And so people are starting to think about um, assisted migration of key species to help them move from one area to another if, uh, if there are no corridors, if the, if the way would otherwise be blocked. So there are yeah, some, uh, some things that are going on that may offer some hope, but um, one of the things I'd really like to see more of, I guess, in, in long-term ecological monitoring is the, is the idea that we can bring together ecological interactions, the things that keep everything ticking, and uh, try to make sure that we're planning for those in a, in a world where climate change is, um, is really gripping us at the moment. Um, fantastic idea, I think, to bring in um, other folks in Africa and, uh, and Europe to, uh, to really build the audience and to build the big picture thinking about the problems and potential solutions. And uh, great to hear too that um, the contributions here can be uh, put forward into a special issue. Well, certainly try to uh, um, put pen to paper. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, in the next uh, discussion, we may focus on some key questions. Uh, for example, whether uh, uh, the uh, what's the benefits of the climate warming to animal populations and what's the, what's the harm to them? And uh, is there any tipping point for for the population dynamics? Uh, because uh, we, we really have uh, more reports that, uh, like in China, we see uh, many species uh, in many regions experiencing uh, sustained population declines. Like uh, uh, mentioned in Europe, we also noticed that in Europe, in Africa, uh, even rodent population also experiencing uh, uh, continued uh, decline. So, uh, whether this is a tipping point for the for the for the for the populations <laughs> dynamics, I uh, know the tipping point is a, a a concept developed by the ecosystem uh, uh, biologist. So, uh, I think this is very important issues and how. Uh, uh, the, the, the population change in space, uh, their expansions or contractions. So uh, maybe uh, uh, the BCGC program uh, can uh, utilize uh, our resources, uh, our scientists, uh, mostly based on long-term studies of population to uh, give our ideas, our views on how climate change affects the animals of the different uh, ecosystems. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? <laughs> uh, Jibin, uh, uh, it just occurred to me, uh, from what you said, which I totally agree with, uh, is that we, we should at some point somewhere discuss, so to speak, the heritability of long-term studies because, uh, something, you know, we're not going to last forever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you need to pass things on with a whole set of uh, techniques field techniques, whatever, uh, you know, in a consistent way so that we don't get, you know, 30 years of data with one technique and then somebody changes the kind of trap or whatever it is, uh, mm -hmm. the kind of temperature device. And uh, so there's a whole problem there, you know, which, again, may not be uh, terribly uh, highly respected, so to speak. You're not going to get the Nobel Prize for it, but you uh, you know you really need to have methods that are consistent, and you need to think if you're going to think long term. How do we mm -hmm. do this? How do we fund this? And right. I think uh, you know we could get the U.S. Long Term Ecological Research um, Centers involved with that kind of discussion because they've got a lot of funding now. And Marcel can correct me, but you know it's probably been for thirty years, forty years now. And uh, my impression, which may be quite wrong, so tell me I'm wrong, Marcel, <laughs> but uh, my impression is that they drift. Okay, you have a long-term research site, uh, a laboratory, if you like, that's doing a lot of work, 
in one direction and then the person retires, the next leader says, oh, no, we don't want to do that. We want to try something else. Mm -hmm. So you don't get any consistency of the long-term thing. You know, I don't know that that's a soluble problem, but it's certainly something we ought to talk about. Okay. Thank you. There are are two things there. One of them is whether you're dealing with something like a long-term experiment versus monitoring. Often in experiments, the treatments drift over time. There's no consistent application of treatment over time. For monitoring, it seems like the uh, it's hard to sustain funding for that. So much of the impetus is on finding new scientific discoveries. That it's hard to do that if you're incrementally adding years to a study. And so I found with the National Science Foundation, we were forced to do lots of experiments on the side to go along with our long-term data. Uh, And so actually finding funding for the long-term monitoring is critically hard. Um, I appreciated your comments, Charlie, about the fact that we could lose a lot of the data as well and the long-term knowledge of what was done in studies. And that's something I think that is extremely valuable to partner with somebody who's going to get that data into a format where a new sci- a young scientist with new techniques and new ideas can analyze some of that data that you're not going to do more with yourself and that way get it into a longer term record. I know my lab has done quite a lot of that with historical data on uh, a an impelled bird species here, for example. And it, and as you say, it's not going to win me the Nobel Prize, but uh, <laughs> it is uh, something that's very useful for conservation and management and also as a baseline for future studies. Um, so I think yeah, those are, those are uh, things that it would be good for the society to think about in terms of what they can do to facilitate such things. And perhaps thinking about something like data papers in uh, the society journal could be one way to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, One thing I I wanted to say uh, more generally about the conversation was uh, a lot of what I'm hearing in the talks, especially thinking uh, about, uh, I'm going to, butcher your name sorry uh wang zi hang on the on the plants uh and uh thinking about your talk about the uh elephants of in uh was that uh it seems that some of these species are unlikely to move themselves and so we need to think about managed translocation of species and there's lots of names for that assisted migration and so on and uh, you were talking. People were talking mainly about corridors for movement, and for some of the spatial scales involved, that isn't very realistic. Uh, and it's we're going to need to actually move species, and so there's a growing literature on that that we haven't sort of really put together with the historical perspectives that we're looking at. And um, you know, we're looking at current distributions and thinking about levels of threat now but that's uh or thinking about gaps in the future but i think thinking as charlie suggested more things to close those gaps uh is important and for also ways of uh thinking innovatively about which species we need to move and i think christopher's talk said quite a lot about the species that are important. Charlie, in your talk, you had snowshoe hares as your keystone species, as it were, uh, in uh, your uh, interaction diagram, your food web, and uh, and so on. So I I think there's some uh, ways of thinking about this that are a bit more forward looking that we could bring in uh, and would be useful. So, and if we're thinking about a special issue, perhaps that's something to invite somebody who does some of those things to participate in. Well, I have the podium to rant a bit, Jivin. I, I The other thing that interests me is the dollars, uh, currency. 
to do this kind of work, which is so difficult. And, and the government, at least here in Canada, it doesn't think monitoring is very important. Um, and yet, um, just to give you an example that's all top secret, I had a phone call two weeks ago from a person who has a hundred million dollars. Now, I don't know what that is in yen. <laughs> and uh, anyway, there are a lot of people in North America. Uh, and I don't know about China, but uh, have, have a hell of a lot of money. Excuse the language. And uh, at some point, they're going to pass on, and, and maybe we could convert some of them to think about uh, these conservation issues. Because, and again, you can't really have a symposium about this, but behind all of these problems are keeping the government on side. And in this case, the Chinese government seems to do. Well, the fund, you, I don't know if that's true or not, but certainly in Canada it does not do well. In the U.S., I think it does much better. But the whole idea is that uh, much more could be done if we had a lot more money. Uh, again, it's not a scientific question. Okay. Thank you. Any more comments? Director Yao? Yao Yingang, Yao Yingang, I'm not sure you are available. And uh, Director Xiao Gexia, and uh, also other participants, you are welcome. If you have a question to the presentations or you have suggestions for the for the future uh, symposium discussion or, or directions, welcome. We can have another few minutes to to have the discussions. Uh, can I add a couple of comments? Yes, uh, yeah, welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, the discussion is very uh, inspiring. Um, uh, in terms of the long-term monitoring, uh, this is actually is very important for uh, for understanding the responses of uh, uh, species and communities to climate change. Um, in terms of the uh, the means to do it. Um, I agree with the, uh, with the, uh, Charles and, uh, 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 bring the collaboration probably between, uh, the, uh, the scientists in the field of biodiversity and the scientists in the field of, uh, of uh, ecosystem ecology. I think in China, there are uh, also a similar network, uh, uh the long term, which is similar to the, to the long term. Ecology monitoring network in U.S. Uh, actually, this network the uh, the uh, do uh, do a very good job in monitoring the uh, ecosystem processes, um, uh, but the their focus is not uh, mainly uh, biodiversity. Uh, but we could probably um, bring the people of these two uh, fields together and by some chances and then. Um, maybe we could, um, try to, um, encourage or to stimulate, uh, stimulate some uh, collaborations in terms of the long term monitoring, uh, insert some of the, um, uh, the, the, uh, agenda of uh, biodiversity monitoring into the, um, the, uh, ecosystem monitoring, uh, within this, um, uh, uh, this long term ecology monitoring network. Um, that's first, um, uh, comment. Uh, the second comment that I think is important, uh, is, um, the discussion today, I think, really, um, calls for the collaboration between, uh, people working on animals and people, people working on plants. Um, both, uh, animals and plants are responding to, uh, global changes. Uh, but probably in different ways. Most importantly, uh, the responses or the different responses of plants and animals may lead to unexpected, uh, 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 we can say collapse of ecosystem or food web, or probably the mismatch, um, more commonly, probably the mismatch, uh, in terms of the phenology, uh, yeah, phenology, uh, and, uh, interactions. Between, uh, uh, between animals and plants. Uh, I think, um, 
the, the scientists or the colonists working on plants and animals could probably work together uh, to uh, look at how uh, how uh, plant animal interactions may may uh, be influenced by different responses of animals and plants in terms of, uh, in response to uh, to climate change. Um, and if we're working on uh, a single side of this foot web, uh, we may actually have a biased uh, uh, conclusion about the potential uh, threats of uh, future global changes on ecosystems. Only when we bring these two groups of people together, we can probably better understand the uh, the impacts. Um, that's um, uh, my second comment. I have only these two comments. Uh, but I think future discussion will, I'm very looking forward to uh, future discussion. I think it will be uh, stimulating. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for your coming to give a presentation. Indeed, uh, uh, in our uh, previously uh, BCGC program uh, meetings, we mostly focus on scientists studying animals. So yeah, indeed, we we will have more, uh, we'll invite more uh, scientists from studying plants or other uh, uh, taxes to join it together uh, to see the impact of the global change on biodiversity. And a species interaction, uh, they are very, yeah, very rarely investigated because uh, uh, long term data are very rare <laughs> on that species. But fortunately, uh, recently in China, we have uh, some progress in uh, some uh, automatically intelligent uh, inter inter uh, monitoring of the ecosystem. Uh, we have set up several uh, site plots that can monitoring the ecosystem uh, of the large, large animals, small animals uh, automatically. So the new technology application will be another uh, important issues i think uh, in uh, in studying uh, about global change uh, on biodiversity okay uh any more comments well Jibin, i just wanted to say uh, thank you to everyone and, and uh, an excellent uh, <laughs> session an excellent symposium and leading to a whole lot of new thoughts <laughs> how to address these problems, but also a progress report for me of uh, incredible work that you have been, your group, uh, all your groups have been doing uh, in China and, and all the other work Chris Dickman's been doing in Australia, you know, there's sort of global agreement of what we should be doing. And uh, <laughs> I think that's great. So I thank you. And now I got to go eat supper. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and then uh, yeah, Charlie have a very good summaries. Uh, we have a uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, quite a productive uh, uh, symposium and the discussions. Uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would uh, thank you very much for uh, our invited speakers for sharing your new progress and your uh, very excellent presentations. Uh, this is really a very uh, hot topic and a very important topic. Uh, and also, I thank uh, many participants. Uh, I, I counted that there are about 150 so people quite interesting uh, uh, to our symposium. Uh, so we'll carry on uh, our BCGC program and uh, hopefully we'll uh, organize another uh, symposium uh, focused on the uh, Europe and uh, uh, and uh, the Africa, and then we will have a synthesis uh, uh, about our BCGC uh, discussions and the conference. Okay, uh, thank you again. Bye bye. Have a yeah time for bye -bye. Bye -bye. now. Thank you. <laughs> and bye -bye. Bye -bye. For you, right? <laughs> thank you very bye -bye. much, everyone. Thank you, Marcel. Thank Chris. you. I'm looking forward Thanks. for more discussions. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, very productive. Thank you. My contribution. Mm -hmm. <laughs>